We've got some new people maybe joining us on the table as well. Grab a seat, grab a seat. Um, can we grab your, we'll do a quick round of names because we have a new people, new people joining the table. I'm Evie, I'm in the middle. There you go. We've got Katie. Katie. Kat. Kat. Ahmed. Ahmed. Ellen. Ellen. Yeah. Alan or Ellen? Alan. Alan. Yeah. Alan. Brilliant. Correct me if I'm wrong. Ahmed. So I, I think what Katie is saying, virtual reality, is I think the mm -hmm. glass is what, uh, 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 that, I mean, that, that's the one she's talking about, virtual mm -hmm. reality, and that, uh, that what she has explored, but what mm -hmm. AI, I'm, I'm saying that's way beyond. <laughs> so AI is sort of way beyond virtual reality? <laughs> yes, you can say that. Yeah. It's, it's a big thing, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, so what makes it way beyond? Can you explain that a bit more? Like, it has many subtopics involved in it. It's like, mm -hmm. a, it's a big market, you can say that. Like, yeah. how, when we just say that a science museum, I mean, natural science museum, but when you come inside, it's divided into several, several things, as you can see. Yes, yeah, yeah. And we are we are in one of the part of them. <laughs> so so is the uh, AI. <laughs> okay, yeah. So it's like a big so virtual reality is just a subsection of AI itself. Um, what has this got to do with nature? Are, are we worried about this? Are we excited about it? Uh, where are we going to take this conversation, guys? I am in the middle. I can't tell you what to to say. Um, so we've got a few thoughts coming, maybe going on over here. I'm kind of interested in what kind of applications you like see for AI as a thing, because like you said, it is like such a huge field and it's so exciting in a lot of ways. Um, but I feel like people also find it somewhat intimidating because we've mm. had so many like sci-fi uh, experiences through like film and TV of artificial intelligence and it being like evil and terrifying. Um, so yeah, I was just wondering what kind of stuff you think AI might do in the future, or stuff that you find really exciting? Because it's not something I know much about, so I think it'd be cool. Yeah, definitely, that's a good question. Oh, yeah. Um, Ahmed, it's a good question. Have you got a good answer? <laughs> I'll, I'll try to answer that. No, I, I don't know whether it will be good or bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, well it's, luckily, you've got some friends around the Tokyo table, so we can give you some feedback. Yeah, yeah certainly, certainly. <laughs> so, I, I mean, she's talking about Skyfi. Uh, mm -hmm. When we talk about mo movie sci-fi, you know what is seen in the uh, the window and wh what we really explore are different actually. The sky sci-fi, wh when we say uh, in terms of movies, is a different thing, and the way, way of how we work in the industry is different. You know. <laughs> okay, so you've got sci-fi is different too, but why do we think sci-fi is actually different to how we work with artificial reality? And like, we've got some new people around the table as well. You know why? Brilliant. Well, tell us your name, and then why is is artificial intelligence different to science fiction? It's is different, different because uh, in the um, I work with artificial intelligence, so you're, you're asking Fantastic. someone would, would know something. But I I disagree that we, because science fiction is very interesting, very very, very it, it, it opens our imagination, but. The problem they are discussed them with the tools we have today, I don't think we can mentally model them. So it's oh. fiction and not science. What we can mentally model is something very different. It's, it's, it's still very technical. It means maybe mm. we can, we would current AI models, we, we can probably regurgitate a lot of knowledge because now statistical models are becoming huge, humongous, but not a reason, not yet mm -hmm. a reason to that level. So. Most of the ethical problem, general artificial intelligence, yeah, is fiction, in mm -hmm. my opinion. And, yeah. and, and I think it will be for 20, 30, 50 years, at least, at least. At least, okay. And then what's going to happen? I mean, there's some opinions on there. So we've got 20, 30 years, that's when kind of the science fiction reality is I mean, talk I mean about. people talk about the singularity when mm. AI learns from itself more than it learns from humans, or something like that. Mm. Someone maybe can... Uh, Help me out there, but I mean, yeah, I don't think, I had a friend who was working with artificial intelligence and it's not that intelligent. It's mostly like crunching huge numbers. So it's, the computers have got the ability to crunch huge data sets mm. and, f and find patterns in them, but that's the only intelligence they've got. Okay, so Mike is saying maybe artificial intelligence isn't so intelligence, just a big raw number cruncher. Uh, I just, you guys seem to know a lot about this, so I'm <laughs> curious. Um, can we actually have an ethical dilemma with AI? Like, will it ever get to the point where it can... Oh. Sound. <laughs> will we have we, an ethical dilemma with where, AI? Where it can actually override a human instruction? Because at the end of the day, 
it can only do what we tell it, so we still have to give it permission to make those decisions. Mm -hmm. You know, or will it get to a point where it can actually say, even though you haven't given me permission to make that decision, I'm still going to think on my own? Mm. Or can it only think because we've said you are allowed to think on your own? Okay, so yeah, so are there going to be, can AI get to that point where it's maybe thinking on its own? Mikey had that singularity question. I'm knocking over some technology as well. Is the AI going to get me? I don't know. Uh, we don't know your name, actually. I'm, I'm Dario. Dario, yeah. Dario, and Dario, you were sort of you were shaking your head. You had a strong opinion. No, the, the strong opinion is whether the answer is yes or not. Mm -hmm. With the current tools, uh, we cannot say, and, and 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 it's useless to think about. Let's okay. let's make fiction about that, yeah. not uh, science. For science, there will be time. Maybe in the next generation, we will not be there, but mm -hmm. uh, not now. Yeah, but uh, it wants to continue. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, well, so you don't think it's it, it will be an issue for us now, but it might be in the future. Uh, does that mean we should think about it? Should we talk about it? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think that's what science fiction is for: is to discuss the eth ethical possibilities. For example, a film like Gattaca, as you know, every we quite often do genomics things, and Gattaca comes up all the time. Mm. And the genomics people love that film because it, discuss, it discusses the question of genetic determinism and whether, you know, actually tweaking genes is actually, you know, what the ethics involved in that, in, in, a, in a very compelling way. And I, th I think, obviously, you can't anticipate the science, but I think you can start to have those discussions, the ethical discussions, in the science fiction. Um, I think, like, iRobot is a, probably the perfect example when it comes to artificial intelligence of a kind of, not the film, the book, <laughs> of uh, the, fi the, book, the film's terrible. Anyway, I'm, I'm waffling on now. Yeah. Okay, but so you think though, though actually um, science fiction is quite, it's there to kind of give us a warning, to, to tell us to think about these things. I'm curious about maybe the people over here, we've got some sinister sounds. It sounds like we've got quite negative views of artificial intelligence. I kind of just wanted to clarify what we actually mean by artificial intelligence, I guess, because mm. it's not something I know the most about. And like we were saying, like I've watched films like iRobot, um, but I, like we were saying, that's not the reality of the situation. Um, so just, we obviously have people who know more about it than me, so I was just wondering what AI actually mm. is at the moment, not what it might be in the future. Or ah, okay. If that's okay, sorry to take us on a little. No, no, please do. Sorry. I mean, we've also got some maybe people wandering down as well, down the corridor here. If you guys know what AI is, or do you, do you guys know what AI is? Maybe, maybe not, not too sure at this point. Uh, maybe come back to us if you have any thoughts. Um, but yeah, Kat's made this point then, actually we're sort of talking about this kind of thing, quote unquote, but do we really understand what it is? Uh, do we need to define it? And I've got, got some thoughts here. And then maybe I'll go Mikey and then Katie. Okay. And then a thought here. No, no, there you go. We're all no, well, I mean, each other. I, mean, just, I just want to bring it back to nature because mm -hmm. we're in the images of nature of course, gallery. Yeah. Like for example, there is an AI which is coming into play, still already being used, that of plant recognition. It's like a Shazam for plants and weeds. Mm -hmm. And you, well, they're using that now to identify the weeds and they laser the weeds instead of using weed killer and toxic chemicals. So it's actually, for the planet, it's actually much better to use a kind of AI laser weeder, which you think, well, that might, that's awfully expensive, but actually it's becoming something that is economically viable. Okay, so, so, so it's actually that it's sort of quite beneficial for nature as well and it's becoming something that we can use more and more. I think I've used a Shazam for plants, maybe I'm wrong, but Katie, you wanted to say something earlier? No, that's all right. Yeah, I was going to say, I think I have also used a Shazam for plants. Mm. It's like, um, it's an app that I cannot remember the name of at the moment, but I've been trying to improve like my identification skills and so I've used that and I didn't even think of that as AI, but that's really interesting because it is, yeah, it's mm. using a database of images and kind of recognising and pattern recognition. So thank you, that was a really useful clarification <laughs> for kind of my understanding. So. I'm going to go over to Alan here. Well, well is, is that really AI, or is that what you're just talking about, Dario, that it's just, it's just really pulling from a database? It's not actual, or, or what I think is mm. artificial intelligence. It's not thinking for itself. Mm. It's just kind of pulling information from a, a source that it's already got, which is what computers have done for 
however long. It's, it's okay. calculating. Yeah. Yeah, well, so there's a, there's a difference maybe between going to a database and making decisions your own. No, I'm going to go to Dario first and then to Ahmed. Yeah, because if, 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 even problems that we may think like, like solving a chess game, which is not mm -hmm. solved, but still, uh, still e e even now the engine in this mobile phone is a lot better than a guy Kasparov or the Deep Blue that guy Kasparov <laughs> challenge with many complaints by, mm -hmm. by him. I, I listen to him anyway. But that's not reasoning because that is an optimization function. I try to optimize a function. Mm -hmm. So again, operative research, not reasoning. Even if it seems the machine is reasoning and you may think what kind of movies it's making, but this optimization is not reasoning yet. Not yet. Yes. Okay. Other mm -hmm. problems like natural language understanding. What, uh, what is said in, in, a, in, in a dialogue is still not reasoning. It's still information extraction mm, or stuff okay. like that. So try to summarize what is said, what, what can be meaningful or not. But without reasoning, mostly on trying to uh, 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 summarize the meaning is, is a lot more complex. But I cannot explain it yeah, in, yeah, in one yeah. minute in a table where I'm not even prepared to talk. Well, but, I would say you probably yeah. did quite a good job because, yeah, I guess the idea is that at the moment, you know, just AI, AI is very complicated. It's very good at number crunching. But it's not yet making, as you say, it's not your phone is not yet listening to you, is what Dara is saying. Not yet, anyway. Or, 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 or at least according to, to either some per programming rules or mm -hmm again statistical, what sentence appear more often in certain domains, yes, so yeah. th those are the most salient. But there's no reasoning behind, it's simply collecting a lot of data from what people say and, mm. and it makes So maybe you're not... Again, I'm simplifying it to, to really... Yes. <laughs> oh, there you go. And that's a quite a good game sound as well. Maybe we're not quite as unique as we think. Maybe that's where we're going from there. Ahmed, you had some points. Yeah. So I had to put something uh, on his point that what he's saying, mm -hmm. where AI collects data from. So AI is, uh, in itself is artificial intelligence. That means it's artificial, not real. Mm, mm -hmm. So uh, it, I mean, humans are the one to give light to artificial intelligence. Like for example, what he says, the device that doesn't give correct uh, answer sometimes. Example, we take uh, like Google. Mm -hmm. So Google only does, I mean, what data we give to Google, that the same th things and as an example, I, I'm putting something on Google servers uh, and you are searching on your phone and ultimately we are help, helping each other. It's not the Google who is helping, it's ultimately we each other helping. And, that, oh. and secondly, when we uh, when put a thought, like artificial intelligence uses a, a, a vast amount of data. It's not like one or two things mm -hmm. when we come to a, a virtual reality. For example, uh, if we see human, for uh, let me take example of you when you go go for H and M, if if you buy if you buy buys a top or how much option she will see, mm -hmm. example to buy a dress or something, then she goes to Primark, uh, other stories stories why why is what say, <laughs> so so this is a, a artificial intelligence so even even here. Data is utilized, a vast data. Mm, mm -hmm. Okay, so everywhere we go, our data is utilized, yeah. I was saying. Uh, you've also uh, said some, oh, carry on, carry on. And ar artificial intelligence can easily be manipulated. It can be, oh, okay, so it can be in easily as, manipulated. Yeah, as, as it is artificial. <laughs> yeah, well, it was interesting because you said right at the beginning that, um, yes, artificial intelligence isn't real, it's easy to be manipulated, uh, and it needs lots of data. Where, where are we going to go with that? Has, does this give people thoughts, opinions, feelings? I think it does. I think what you've just said actually was something I've never thought. You know, that, what does that word artificial mean in intelligence? Mm. Um, I think that's a very interesting thought. Um, because, you know, if we look at nature again, if we take it back to being in here, uh, you think about the fact that, you know, we, are, we have certain instincts which are almost in bolt, and that's, that's almost that unartificial part. The rest of it is implanted data. It's things that we taught, like going to Primark, and that's <laughs> what we can teach a computer. But can we teach it that natural instinct, or Ooh. is artificial intelligence completely artificial? And I guess that's where it becomes, to what you're saying, where it becomes ethical, mm. is when it moves out of that realm of artificial, so out of AI to just I, and okay. computers start to get intelligence. Again, loads of thoughts there. So yes, I guess learning about, um, you know, can we learn, can AI learn from nature in the same way it learns about humans, humans' patterns? I think... Uh, in theory, a way, there is a way. 
Um, yes. but which is simply trying to encode all the possible rules uh, of which animals, humans, mm -hmm. every natural mm -hmm. being would act, which is probably the paradigm, if I'm, I may be wrong, but the paradigm that was intended in the 50s and the 60s. Ah, how to solve artificial intelligence? Simple. We write tables of rules and we solve <laughs> the problem. Unfortunately, this problem is infeasible. Mm -hmm. you, you, you really need to, to stay there for, for centuries before you can even scratch the surface of how the nature works uh, right now. So, it, it, that, 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 that is, the, the meaning is there is a theoretical way to solve it, but it's completely infeasible. So, mm. what do you do? What do you do? Has anyone got any answers to that? Any thoughts to, uh, to try and save us on this fact? <laughs> no, you just made me laugh. Um, I just, it just, I don't know, and this all starts me thinking about kind of morality, and you were talking about the, the plants and making the decisions about like which plants to destroy. And then when you start talking about what plants to destroy, mm. that kind of makes me feel kind of funny anyway, because when we look at plants as weeds, we're not looking at like a complete ecosystem and we're not kind of understanding what's there. And then it kind of just, that the morality thing is really interesting to me. And also, like, the, our own failings and the idea that we're just putting them on... It's, it's us who's using it that's deciding mm. that maybe we're the danger. Maybe we're the danger, yes. If we're trying to use uh, AI to decide what plants to, des to destroy, got, is that I've our own that fault? A, a bit loud, that sound effect. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I'm not in a position to adjust it. It's very complicated. But, um, I'm going to stop. Um, it's not just plants with, uh, that the computer is deciding what to destroy it. You know, there's, there are actually AI weapons out there already, mm. and they're, they're deciding what humans to destroy. I mean, there is, you know, I think a convention about that saying that you can't actually have a AI, a lethal AI, but actually most armies have developed AIs. When, you know, we've got already in the current Ukraine conflict that a lot of the warfare has been done by drones, especially on the Ukrainian side, um, and if they're not AI, they're actually, they're, 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 I mean, there is an element of AI to them, but the, the actual sort of final decision to, to hit up, the push the button mm -hmm. is done by humans still, I think. Um, but, you know, that, is that the future of, you know, are we, are we going to have uh, machines that kind of, you know, decide which humans to keep and which mm. to destroy? Okay, so we sort of bring it back to, well, yeah, there's um, talking about artificial intelligence and the sort of cyber warfare that's going on right now. Um, we still try and have quite a lot of fail-safe human code within it. Is that the safest way? Where are we going to go take this? I kind of wanted to tie together a few of the points, I guess, because um, when we were talking about kind of encoding like human behaviour and behaviour of animals, um, I was thinking about how... It's been proven that, AI, I don't know if it is AI or just like, the kind of technologically sorting data, I guess, which is what we were talking about. Um, it's already been proven to have human biases. Um, so I know there was an experiment on Twitter that was done about pictures of like people of color versus white people. And Twitter always picked the white people um, to put in the little image um, preview that you, that you get. First. Yeah, because you get the kind of squashed uh, images on Twitter. And I just, I don't know, that would be an interesting thing of like how much of if we try to encode like human behavior into a machine like how much of that is going to end up with the systemic biases of the people who do that encoding in the first place i don't know mm. i think that's an interesting point and if it was to decide life or death potentially that could be problematic <laughs> so some good points there yeah even when we're designing something do our own human biases come into something that's artificial and and what we think is rational yeah it comes because the data we are collecting is biased mm. very simple and uh, the, the, the even work that tried to cancel this bias, but unfortunately that does very little to do. I mean, even commercial system, face detection system, if the face is black, they, they get bonkers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, now I can't remember the exact examples, but it happens. But why? Because it's a, a lot easier to collect uh, white faces, or, or at least the, that kind of system was market where people, the majority of people were white, for instance. Mm. Medical system too, that's the, the big problem. Mm. System are right? designed to save lives when are not working with skin colors of a certain uh, thing, but sometimes just for marketing because it's easy to collect certain uh, or to to train the system to, to work in certain condition. 
Mm. Then people don't think about sometimes when when money are involved. Yeah, so Dara's bringing in some good points there. It's about the data you collect. It's about what makes money at the end of the day as well. It's about people's biases. Um, that shapes not not just artificial intelligence. Um, lots of things in life. I've got any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, this isn't exactly artificial intelligence, but if you just, I mean, Rick sometimes does visuals for the Tokiyoki, and then, you know, say. Say, for example, you want to type in, you want an image of a doctor or politician. Mm. You're going to get, if you Google image that search, the first 10 hits are going to be white, white men, mm. most likely. Um, and it's, it's not the, I don't think it's the systemic sort of bias of Google. I think it's deeper than that. You know, I'm sure the same thing would happen with any search engine. Um, it, I think we need to be aware of this systemic bias, but it's, it's deeper, I think, than the artificial intelligence. Mm. So Mike's saying if you can't just blame maybe like a search engine or an artificial intelligence, it's reflective of more things. That, what Mike was saying was making me think uh, about like when I use the internet, I feel like I'm just using like mm -hmm. something that's tailored towards me, the language I speak like the country that I'm in, all of those things. And so in some ways it makes me interested to think if I was using, I'm going to say like, if I was using a language from another country where there was predominantly a different ethnicity and I searched for a doctor in that language, that if I had come up with that, I mean, mm. just a question. Just, uh, I'd, I'm not sure what I'd come up with. Mm. Okay, so it's interesting been thinking about yourself as a user. I'll go to Alan and then Ahmed. Yeah, I, I do know, or, or from what I've read up, that, you know, because Google, any search engine uses their algorithms based on previous searches, etc. So it mm. does tailor your experience for you as well. So I would imagine, <laughs> uh, no, no, so I would imagine yeah. that it would do exactly that. Yeah, but if, yeah. you, if you're living in a particular country, it is going to tailor it for that country. Um, I know there was a big thing with the whole when Trump was still in, that if you were a Trump supporter and you Googled Trump, you got all positive articles. And if you were a Trump hater, you got all negative articles. So people couldn't understand. They were like, but just Google it and you'll see a hundred mm. articles telling you why he's so bad or why he's so amazing. But it's Brilliant. simply because we're getting we're not being fed the same information because the database is, is pulling out different bits that are tailored for us. Yeah. So Alan's sort of telling, you so, know, yeah. actually we kind of like end up creating our own echo chamber almost. And Ahmed, you were, no, you were nodding and giving a lot of thumbs up, so I'm keen because you look like you're, you're someone who knows something about this. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say that uh, artificial intelligence, you know. Yeah, come and join, yeah. Uh, what, what I was going to say was uh, when we when we use Google, Google mm. Translate, I mean Google, Google product, people who are coming from another country or doesn't know languages as she mentioned, Katie mentioned, uh, so I want to say, uh, Google only, t I mean, that can really put in, uh, into trouble sometimes, like, ah. <laughs> uh, every, every advantage comes with a ready-made two disadvantages. <laughs> <laughs> Technology, no doubt, has made us life easier, but mm -hmm. it has also put us, put many people in trouble in terms of many things <laughs> that I, I, I should not mention it by. But, but yeah, but nevertheless, it's useful. But what I was saying is, uh, as he said, many records are, I mean, previously used, and they, they make it tailored. I, I, I accept that. That's a really good point. And mm. for example, I, they, I was using the language which I, which I didn't knew. So. Uh, Google translates only word to word, not the entire sentences. You, you see, yeah. it, it translates word to word. Like, example, we are communicating something, and uh, our, uh, that, so that that can go wrong in in uh, when we use Google. <laughs> Ah, okay. Well, I think that's quite exciting, though. So, it's even it's not just using the right language well, I mean, and the right phrases. Yeah. So, if if we come to human tendency, I mean that I mean when a human interacts is is different, and mm -hmm. when we use uh, AI. So that's what I was saying. AI is, after all, AI. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant. No, I think there's some really good points. And actually, we've got, we've got a few new people who join the team. I think we've uh, heard some round of applause as well. So what I'll do is we'll just do a quick round of names to introduce each other. Uh, my name's Evie. Katie. Kat. Ahmed. Alan. Dario. Lee Chow. Lee Chow. Yeah. 
Mikey. Mikey. And we've been, we've, well, we sort of, we were talking a lot about artificial intelligence. Uh, we were talking about how it related to nature. Uh, we were talking about how we made it ethical. Uh, and when recently we've been looking at um, how we, when you use Google, do you use Google as your search engine? How do you try and tailor your searches so you don't get uh, an echo chamber back? Is it kind of the mirror? Is it actually reflecting your systemic biases? Mm. It's actually the mirror of, of your prejudice in a way or your privilege, everything mm -hmm. is coming back to you at Google by showing you this world of your own expectations. Is Google just your vanity mirror? I like to mess with my Google so um, and, and with, with YouTube particularly. So YouTube mm -hmm. often thinks that I am a black American female and um, yeah, I get a lot of like hair products, particularly for Afro hair, a lot of hair tutorials. I get a lot of kind of, and then every once in a while, I realize if, I, if something comes up in my feed and I linger on it, it changes it completely. Mm. So a lot of like, I just like messing with it. Okay, so you're trying to look at products you might not use, but trying to change them to see what you get suggested. Yeah, I was going to say, like, my AdSense, because I quite like looking at um, what different companies and different websites think of me, um, when you can look that up. And mine is wild. Like, it's, it's not me at all, which I think is really interesting. And I don't know what I did wrong <laughs> to give them this completely false impression of me. But I get stuff about, like, being a father in your 50s. And I'm just like, I don't know what I did <laughs> to have this. But it's... Mm. Yeah, I do, I'm not mm. sure, but like it's it's interesting whether if we do have this kind of um, footprint of ourselves online, whether it's a realistic one or whether it's mm. something completely different from who we actually are. I don't know, it's interesting and to me. Yeah, do do we know how we control our identity online? Do you, do you know? Do you guys know what your identity online is? Do you like it? I'm, I'm going to go to Alan. I, I think the you know that that's exactly how these companies make their money. That's why they don't charge you because of true targeted ads. And where I saw it the most was I use Apple products. Mm -hmm. And when they introduced turn off uh, ad, ad tracking, um, I immediately turned that on on my devices. And on all my platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, it didn't matter what, all my adverts changed completely to completely random things. Whereas before I was getting a similar thing you know, it would always kind of be, I've now Googled a hair, clip, hair clippers and for the next five weeks, all I see is hair clippers. <laughs> now I'm getting, wh what do you do if you fall pregnant when you're 50? <laughs> you know, similar. But again, it's got no relation anymore to my searches. Mm. Um, and it's really interesting to see how quickly that changes mm. according to those algorithms. Ah, so you were thinking that you know by turning off ad blockers, you can kind of uh, change what you get to see online. Uh, it seems like quite a positive round. We've got we've got people sort of wandering past. But Do you guys like to uh, control what you get shown? Your, the adverts that you guys are shown online. Are, are you worried about the adverts that you guys get shown online? Does Google know more about you than you know about yourself? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, are you happy with that? No. <laughs> oh, interesting. Well, if you'd like to come along, this is Talkyoki. Uh, we're talking about some sinister topics. We're talking about we talk, well, we're a talk show. We can talk about anything you want. Uh, today, at the moment, we're talking about adverts that we see online. Uh, do we like the adverts we see online? Do we try and control them? Uh, do we try and hide what we uh, get tracked on online? So if you've got any opinions on that, grab a seat. Come and get involved. Uh, let us know. I'm interested in we've got a few different ages now as well. Yeah. How do people feel about the adverts I, that they I, see I online? I wonder if people care because I don't really care if Google and Facebook and whatever mm. collect data about me. I, I can't be bothered with it anymore. Can't be bothered? So you I don't was really a bit care? like you before and now I was just like, whatever, let them do it. You know, if they're going to provide me with free stuff, let them get their end mm -hmm. of the bargain. Might be useful. You might like to have an ad that's tailored to you. I don't know. Come and grab a seat, guys. Yeah, this is indeed a point that many people, even experts, make. We, we don't care as, as long as the, the outcome is useful, but sometimes it's not useful because the recommender system that are now there, the, the YouTube one, she, she was talking, I found it quite terrible. It's not recommending me things I want to see, mm -hmm. and it's recommending me things where, where, where I watch a video for 10 seconds. Sometimes it just keeps recommending stuff 
about that, mm. but I, I perfectly know that after 10 seconds, it's not a hit, it's a miss, in, even <laughs> in lingo. <laughs> of, I, I, I have not worked with a commercial system, but I know a little bit how things work. But th there are websites that um, try to model the, the recommendation a little bit in a more transparent way, actually. Mm -hmm. the, 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 a fa there's a university research project called Movie Lens, who does movie recommendation, film recommendation, that okay. at least for American movie tends to be quite accurate for my taste. So. Okay, okay. And, and, and it's interesting because it just does not just pop up the, the films you like, but it, it predicts actually the score in um, five star that you would put to that film. Ah, brilliant. So, Darren, yeah. you, you found that actually you found online ads really annoying, but you're actually now finding another site to give you a better recommendation because, for example, YouTube gives you the wrong recommendations from the film. No, no, well. because they are graded this recommendation system. They need to sell. So, for, ah. for the majority of people, that, yes. that, that, that recommendation system makes the, the Google earning money the problem mm. is we is far away from the mean, right? Yeah, Two or three sense. sigma away. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you guys have got any opinions on the ads that you see online, do you get annoyed by them? Do you not? Come and grab a seat as well. I've got Mike, you have a thought. Well, here. I'm wondering if sort of the future of films will be rather than the, the system deciding which film you're going to like the most, the system actually creating a film based on your personality. Will it actually make a story that... Uh, with the characters that you actually like, mm. um, based on the sort of modular components, and actually create a film, and all, it will have the product placement in there as well. Um, will that be the future of of, kind of, of entertainment? Mm. That you'll get your own personalised film. Um, I, don't, I wouldn't say what my film would be about, but... Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, Mike uh, is yeah. predicting a future where we get our own personalised films with our own personalised ads inside. Um, d does this seem like a reasonable future? Would you want to change that future? I mean, I, I would hope that that's not the future because I quite like, I don't know, art as it is <laughs> and experiencing what someone else has intentionally created. Um, like, I've, I've bring it back to games, I guess. I, like, I've played games which are mm. completely, like, randomly generated and you're meant to get a different story every time and it's meant to be... Uh, and it's never as deep or compelling just because it hasn't been intentionally put together. It is put together by a computer and that's mostly mm. random. Um, so hopefully that is not the future of film. Okay, across. so you're thinking actually you quite like an independent, you don't want all a film based on your suggestions. Uh, we've got some new people at the table who are maybe join the table as well. Come and grab a seat, give us some topics. Uh, can I grab your name very quickly? Alvit. What was that? Alvit. Alvit. Yeah. Alvit. What's your opinion on, uh, yeah, I mean, we, you heard us a little bit earlier talking about ads online. Um, what's your opinion on this? I, I am a data scientist, so, ah. so I, 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 I might be partially working in this field. Not, not, <laughs> not, not ad specifically, but is it effective? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. What are we paying? And, and people, people seem to be fairly happy to, to with, with them because they like to use services like Google or Facebook for free. Mm. So, okay, so that's a good point. A bit like Mikey, perhaps, of it. you're saying, well, actually, people are quite happy to use Google. They're happy to maybe have ads that are following their, track, tracking their history. Because, actually, you get quite a good service for free, and that, you know, that's quite good. We've got also a new person here. What's your name? Hi, my name is Hiana. Hiana? Hiana? Uh, welcome, Hiana. We've been talking, well, we've been talking a bit about um, films that are tailored to you, ads that are tailored to you, nature, AI. Um, we can really talk, take this conversation anywhere. Uh, this is Talkioki, the pop-up talk show. You guys are our VIPs, uh, and we've been battling out a few topics. But um, where do we want to go from this, guys? We've had, uh, are you worried about the ads that you see online? Yes, sometimes, <laughs> not all the time. But you're trying to get people into a different place. Come back later, guys. Um, do, do people feel like, oh, Derry, you off? Later, yes. Give us a final thought before you go. Uh, maybe it comes later, I don't know. But uh, well, well, the, the, the topic changed quite often, so final <laughs> thought is a little bit difficult. But, uh, what are you going to throw in now to keep yeah. What's the next subject to you? Yeah, that's a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> Because, yeah, no, maybe you can continue, right? Okay, yeah. okay. Dari, Dari, perhaps Dari needs a suggestion from uh, Google to where we're going to go for this conversation next. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Is this making us more stupid? Like the fact that we're no longer choosing, that Google's actually choosing for us. It's, it's showing us where to, how to navigate the city. It's showing us what books to read. 
or even actually not audio books. It's not, you know, mm. it will give us audio books rather than something we actually have to read. Is it actually making us more stupid? Okay, is artificial intelligence making us more stupid the way we use search engines? Is it making us more stupid? We've got a couple of people who have joined. So what we're going to do is do a quick round of names just to introduce ourselves to, to everyone. Mikey. Katie. Kat. Amit. Arvid. Hannah. Ellen. Rory. Nella. Mella. Jaya. Jaya. Alice. Alice. Brilliant. Welcome, guys. This is Talkioki. We're a pop-up talk show. Um, who here has got opinions? Do you think that the way that we use the, uh, the internet, the way that we use AI at the moment, is it making us more stupid? Uh, so something that um, I think about a lot is navigation and how mm. like a, a lot of people, a lot of my friends were always like, how did, our, how did our parents just like know how to get to places without like Google Maps and all this stuff? And I think definitely like it's that thing of if you took it away from us, then maybe we'd have to learn the skill. But like mm. you just don't like whenever I'm driving anywhere, it's only until I've repeated a route three, four five times that like it's actually memorized because otherwise I'm just following whatever, you know, Google Maps says. And then it does just suddenly make you think, what if it told you to go somewhere else? <laughs> <laughs> We're sort of maybe losing our, our skills, but you're, you're quite hopeful. You think maybe we'd pick it up, but it's more through necessity that we, uh, we don't have these skills. I've got Kat, you've got a thought over here. I think generational differences in knowledge is really interesting because, yeah, like my, my mum can just navigate her way anywhere because that's what she had to do. And, like my grandparents, my granddad could like grow any plant and just knew how to do that. And like my granny could cook anything. And all of that stuff, I need to Google it. Like I need to, yeah, have a GPS to follow. I need to, every time I want to make something, Google it again because I just cannot remember it. And I don't know if that's just my capacity, like my memory is worse than theirs or I have different things in my brain. I'm not sure, but it's an interesting mm. one. We've got quite a lot of thoughts there. I think um, I'll go for, is it Alice? Yes. yes. Yeah. I think, um, I'm not sure if it's necessarily making us stupid. I think we have to absorb a lot more information right now. So, you know, there's only so much that the human brain can handle, I think. So, you know, you're not going to remember those things in as much detail and perhaps as quicker as you, you know, other generations would because the breadth and the amount that you're having to remember is way broader. Okay, so Alice, sort of defending the human race here, we're not losing our skills, it's just that we, um, we just have to absorb a lot more information. I said I'll go to Katie and then I've got Alan as well. If you've also got a, a thought, pop your hand up, wave at me. This reminds me of those videos on the internet where they, they're trying to prove how stupid people are in different countries by asking them questions about geography. And, mm -hmm. um, and I don't think those prove anything about intelligence, they just prove something about a body of knowledge. And now the oh. body of knowledge has kind of moved out s externally, like to us, and, um, but I don't think that makes us less intelligent. I think we're just mm. using our brains in a different way and we're, we're treating all the technology as like a bank for the body of knowledge. Mm. We've got uh, Alvi as well and then uh, lots of thoughts on this. It also seems that the younger people who have been grown up with the internet have an easier time differentiating mm. what is truth and what is most likely fake news and, and older people seem to be struggling more with that. Oh interesting, so actually you're saying that, that in some ways maybe younger people have got different skills to deal with the internet, they're good at telling the difference between fake news and uh, real news, uh, whereas actually older people struggle a bit more. Uh, there, were a few, there were quite a few nods actually, who, who have got, there we go Ahmed. So especially the teenagers doesn't want to remember Long, long answers or something like they just want a small, small things. Like long answers, yeah, did you say? Yeah, in the school. Okay. <laughs> they, I mean, they find it very difficult to learn because of this technology. And mm. what one thing is said is, you know, my father said me that, you know, when he gave me a phone number, mm -hmm. and I said it's, it's very hard to remember. What you are saying? We used to remember so so uh, number during our time. Yes. And, yes. But I said that I, I need a fancy number. So what fancy? <laughs> <laughs> so you see, that's the thing. And, mm. and the, again, the phone book in the phone made, made it easy to save, just save the number and that, that's it. Mm. So it's maybe like a loss. Yeah. Remembering a phone number. Do you know any phone yeah, numbers yeah. So, apart so, from your so, own? So, so the gone are the days when they used to note in the pads and so remember, but <laughs> now it's nothing. <laughs> I think Johanna, you was uh, you had to, oh, sorry, is it Johanna? Yep. Yana. To be fair, my grandparents would probably call five people ever, right? Like I have, <laughs> you know, I don't even know how many mm. people in my phone and in my social media. Like, of course, I'm not going to remember the, that number. Oh, so that's quite a good point actually made. So it's again, it's that, that volume of knowledge versus uh, access to knowledge. I've got over here and then Alan. 
I like what you were saying before about the things that we have to know have kind of changed because I think what the internet lets you do is learn, learn a lot more about something very specific and I imagine anyone who spends a lot of time on the internet probably has a lot of things that don't really sound like they're that useful to know but it's also not necessarily that useful to know where every country in the world is on a map or, or whatever else and I think there's a lot more sort of narrowing but sort of deepening of what people know. Mm, so maybe we're becoming experts in very specific things. Yeah, I think I'm agreeing with most of you that it's not necessarily a transference of intelligence, but it's actually skills that are being transferred. So we can't read a map because we don't need to read a map. You know, there's no point. Why, why do I need to read a map? I've got a computer that can do it for me. But I think I like what you guys were saying on that side. Um, I don't know if you've heard the concept of digital natives and digital immigrants. So younger people are digital natives, they're born into it. Whereas older people are digital immigrants. So you give your mum the phone and you tell her 50 times how to open mm -hmm. her email and she still comes to you, but I can't find my email. Mm. Whereas you give it to a four year old who can't even read what's on the screen and they can open it just instinctively and again, it comes, I mean, it's circling back to that artificial intelligence and the whole what becomes instinctual intelligence and almost becomes built in and just mm. natural to us and what requires conscious thought and action. Mm. Quite so, an interesting yeah. thing to bring up in the Natural History Museum, our instinctive use of the internet. One thing I would say, though, is a struggle is that the internet doesn't teach you critical thinking. So, you know, you got you might not know where Kazakhstan is, but you could hopefully point to the general area, right? Like some of those videos on the internet, they've got people saying North Korea is Australia and South Korea is New Zealand. Like, you should at least be able to get a more general sense and use their critical thinking skills to guess mm. more accurately where a country is. Oh, so again, we've got this kind of theme of like, how, how do we teach that critical thinking? We need critical thinking when we've uh, used the internet. So somewhat related is you, you have more access to a variety, variety of opinion um, than, than you might have had in the past. Could also mm. easily, go, easily go the other way. If I remember mm. my, my parents right, grew up in a, in a communist country their educational schedule, especially when it comes to history, was one-sided, to, to say the least. Right? And nowadays, and technically on Wikipedia, you have a lot more different sites. However, if you, you know, Google and, and, and go deep down the rabbit hole, you might become very one-sided again. So, so there's, it, it could easy, easily go both ways, depending on the person looking for information. I mean, there's, uh, yeah, so it can go both ways. How do you, um, how do you deal with this huge uh, amount of opinion? Uh, we've got new opinions on the table, so I'm going to do another round of names, if that's all right. I'm going to start over here. Uh, yeah, Alice. Mikey. Go around here. Katie. Kat. Ahmed. Arvid. Gemma. Hannah. Alan. Emma. Mella. Jaya. Brilliant, and we've already done Alice, so that's all right. We can't go around again. Hello, I'm Evie. I'm sitting in the middle. This is Talkyoki. It's a pop-up talk show where we need your opinions, your ideas, your debates. Come and grab a seat. Um, we've been talking. We've been talking about loads of things at the moment. We've been talking about, um, yeah, your our instinctive use of the, the internet. Are we digital natives? Are we digital immigrants? Um, how do we cope with the sheer amount of information and opinions online? Uh, there's a, an opinion behind me, Mikey. No, I just think. Uh, you know, it's just a question about, I think critical thinking is exactly where it's at, but I don't think we are more critical anymore. Oh, final thought, maybe. Yana, before you leave, we need your final thought. So whenever you leave the Tokyoki table, we need a final thought. It could be something to sum up what you thought about today. It could be a new topic to throw into the uh, table before you leave. Sure, sure. Um, well, I used to work as a teacher, and my big thing was always about how do you teach critical thinking, mm. because you can give as much information as you want, but kids don't know what to do with it. So you bring them to a museum, if they can't think any useful thoughts with it, what's the point of bringing them? Brilliant. That's my last thought. How do we think of fantastic? You're going to get a clap of applause. An IRL clap of applause, not just a virtual one. But what was that, Amos? 
Only a teacher would have seen this. <laughs> <laughs> well, where are we going to go from this topic here? What, what, what do people... Yeah, I also teach, and I think it's really interesting to try and um, sort of... Before you go, Alvi, we'll need your final thoughts. So yeah, we'll go Alice, the, and then we'll go you. The whole point of critical thinking is you really want to encourage children to think for themselves, but then, you know, but the whole nature of teaching is that you're guiding them. So there is always mm. going to be a degree of bias in whatever teacher is there and sort of presenting oh. that. So how do you unpick that? without confusing them. Oh, so you're going to try and teach critical thinking, but you want to and teach it in an unbiased way. Is it possible? Uh, maybe. Teach them problem final solving, thoughts. in my opinion, and then they're going to be fine. Ah, teach them problem solving. Thank you very much. Have you, have you got any other final thoughts for us before you leave? No. Just problem solving. I like that. What a problem to solve. Um, grab a seat, guys, if you'd like to come along. That's all right. We are talking about school, actually, about how you teach, uh, how you make sort of decisions about what you read online, how you can tell whether it's real or is it fake. Um, how do you teach older people to use the internet? I also think there's a thing there, there's an implication that you shouldn't trust your teacher because, you know, they're coming from a certain place and mm. should you just trust exactly what they've got to say? That is the question. Yeah. The, yes. The, before you go, Emma, give us, a, give us a first thought and a final thought at the same time. Uh, education is important and everyone should take as much time and thought to absorb as much as possible. Brilliant, and thank never you. Stop learning. Never stop learning. Okay, loads of things probably go from there. Uh, although Alice did throw in there that even when we're trying to be unbiased, we might teach in a biased manner. So uh, perhaps there's some risks when we teach, teach I people. I mean, I think it's inevitable that you're going to teach your own biases, aren't you? Um, mm. I mean, I think luckily teachers are mostly quite open-minded people that have got but it's still a particular view of the world you can't mm. help passing that on to other people surely mm. Gemma I've seen some nods over here oh, yeah. no 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 do you want to add anything into there or um, I don't know <laughs> don't worry if not I just I just thought I saw you nodding so I thought I'd just check in I don't think having a bias is necessarily a bad thing in a teacher though because like kids have so many different adults who they interact with who they learn from like throughout their kind of growing up and their fundamental learning years and I think that's important because everyone comes from a place of bias like everyone they're going to interact with in the world does and so it's important people skills in some ways like I had some lovely teachers who I, I, I was taught critical thinking in sixth form um, and my teacher was very lefty and it was like interesting to hear her opinions and the ones that I agreed with and debate with her the ones that I didn't and I think that's an important part of the critical thinking process as well is understanding that everyone comes from a place of bias and engaging with that. I d I'm going to go to Alan on there. Go and come and understand that you want lots of people around you because everyone's got some biases. Yeah, I, I think I, I'm also from a teaching background, so, um, and I think it's really important to note that bias isn't necessarily negative. You know, we assume that bias, you know, we've got this view of bias that it must mean that it's racial bias or it's sexual bias or something like that. My bias might be to teach children that they must be kind to everyone. And that is a bias. Um, so we are going to come, you know, it's part of being human that we, we do have bias and we can't remove that. Um, I think what it is is to sort of go... What, what becomes my personal opinion and what's a bias that builds character, you know, and, and those types of things. And, and we are going to influence people with our bias. Mm -hmm. It's just, do we think that we're influencing them in a positive way, a negative way? You know, and I think it's about looking at our own bias and, and actually making conclusions about what we feel about ourselves and are we teaching the right thing or, or not. Brilliant. I like that. So we're kind of discussing about who do we trust the people that we do teach us, um, or are they going to always kind of be a bit biased? They're going to share their own opinions. Um, I'm going to ask: Do you guys trust your teachers? Yes, we do. Uh, <laughs> what makes you trust them? Um, it's a difficult one. Uh, it's a very difficult one. But yeah. We just trust them. But, yeah, I mean, it's quite a good We've got a couple of teachers around the table as well. How do you know when you go into school each day that they're not just lying to you, for example? I don't know. That's reason. 
You don't know. Okay, brilliant. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's fair enough, isn't it? Um, but, you know, we've been trying to discuss how do we sort of make sure that the information that we get, how do we know it's right? When you use the internet, how do you know what's fake news, what's real news? Uh, Geo, yeah. do you have some thoughts on that? Uh, sure, sure. Um, so, I think what's really interesting is the way we're all sort of talking like there's a... All of these conversations often lead towards this kind of presumption that there's like a right answer anywhere to be found. Um, and I think something that's like an interesting global phenomenon, and I don't want to stray too far from the point, but like, is that before, obviously, you know, before information technology and stuff are developed to the degree it has, like one country would have no interactions with another country because of how far away they were or whatever. Now, because of technology, we're all so connected to each other. I find it interesting that there's this sort of this concept that the whole world is slowly becoming just like one village that all has to follow exactly the same set of rules um, and you know I think that we're all supposed to be as you were saying um, Alan uh, that you know the biases are inherently human and that probably like as a collective organism like we're all different for a reason and that that will lead towards like collective success um, and I sort of fear a little bit the kind of homogeny that can sometimes be at the back in the background like that's being proposed mm -hmm. by these kinds of discussions of like oh we all need to act the same way and it's like no I really don't think we should even though like that might work for some people actually maybe it's even important that some people are doing bad things out there or that some people are kicking up trouble um, and that sort of thing uh, Mia, before you go, can you throw us a final thought for the table? I know it's a talk yoki rules. Before you leave, you have to give us a final thought. I didn't know this was a precondition. Um, no, but, <laughs> but I do agree. I mean, um, with what you said, I don't think that there's a, a right answer to everything. And mm -hmm. I think, I mean, that is what what school does right and hopefully has always done and maybe it's doing this more now than it did mm -hmm. before that students are encouraged to discuss their own opinions and use a lot of resources to find um, well to, to look at differently biased resources to debate and write essays and I think this is not only helpful in school and to write essays in university but also to deal with the internet because you will know for every opinion you find there's a a hundred other opinions that say a different thing. So, yeah. A uh, brilliant you. final thought. Excellent. Thank you very much. You get a round of applause as well, real life and virtual. Um, so, I mean, we've got a few. We had Gio here who was worried about the fact that the, that the world's actually maybe we're all becoming a bit too similar. And actually, we need to have people who disagree with each other. Maybe we need to have people doing bad things as well. And that's maybe an important part of being human. We've got loads of new faces here. So, I think importantly, can we do a round of names? And you've got a thought as well, haven't you? Do you want to tell me your name first and then tell me what you think? My name's Matilda, and also um, I think that he makes a point because we're all not the same, and so we have our different reasons to different answers. Okay, yeah, so everyone's got like a different idea, and so then like a different background maybe, they were not the same, so we've all got different uh, answers to different questions. Um, Matilda, thank you, that's your name. I'm going to go round and just do a quick uh, round of names. My name's Matthew. Matthew, brilliant. In the back here. Charlie. Charlie. Ellen. Ellen. Dan. Jaya. Alice. Mikey. I'm going to switch around here. I'm Evie in the middle. Katie. Kat. I'm a... It's pretty... Gemma. Gemma. Um, and Gemma, I think you had a point and then we kind of lost you there. No, so I'd love fine. to bring you in if that's all right. Yeah, I don't know if I'm convoluting everything, but I guess I do think with the internet there are tons of different opinions that are all the way out there but I also think we all curate accidentally maybe our own internet worlds and we all live in a space where we're like oh if you're lefty then you tend to congregate with all the lefty people and all of a sudden you get things on Etsy which are like cross sections of people that like things that you like and then when things happen in the real world you're like oh my god I thought everyone was the same as me like there was a significant political event when the vote went one way and I wasn't expecting it because everybody in my internet world was like that'll never happen that's a dumb idea so I think sometimes although it's I see those pages that are against how I think and I think god that's awful I should pay more attention to it because in the real world those people have mm. more power than we realize we think we're living in our universe and everyone thinks the same as us on the internet because you can shut yourself away but that's not how it works so I think that's part of the critical thinking element recognizing all that those other people do exist and you do have to think about them you can't mm. shut yourself away brilliant that's a great point Gemma can't shut your way, uh, yourself away from people that disagree with you, you otherwise you might get blindsided Gia Alice you guys are leaving uh, leave us with some final thoughts um, you yeah, know I just think it's really in sorry really interesting and important to have 
and it's an aid to critical thinking to have forums like this where people of different ages and backgrounds are speaking, especially people of different ages where you are not sort of talking as an adult, as a teacher to a child. It's more sort of equal and I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Said by a teacher, so there we go. I was going to say something very similar actually. I think everything Gemma was just talking about is like a really growing problem that we're facing with all this high paced online stuff where you don't need to listen, everyone's getting more divided echo chambers. I think this is a really nice like antidote to that where we've got so many different people here from so many different backgrounds and you've got to actually sit and listen and wait your turn and there's lots of discussion of interesting ideas of people of all ages and backgrounds. So I think it's beautiful. So thank you everyone. It's thank been you very, very nice. much. You get a good, again, you get a real life and a digital round of applause. Uh, so we're living both in the digital and the real life world today. What's different? We've got lots of curious people. Come and grab a seat if you fancy. This is Talkioki. Um, I'm Evie. It's a pop-up talk show. Uh, and we've been talking about, well, we've been talking about how we can, how do we know this stuff is true? Uh, how do we sort of chat to people that we don't agree with? Is it important to chat to people who are different from you? And we've got Mikey over here. So I just want to come up to the point about social media, and it does just reflect the ideas that we think ourselves rather than actually putting us in a room with other people but I think that it, I think that's down to the computer scientists and engineers that they've done a really bad job at actually designing the system because they could design it in a way that actually if they wanted to they could design it in a way that actually got people talking to people that they disagreed with and finding mm -hmm. commonalities or if they wanted to but they d obviously don't want to so it's the fault of the social media designers that's why we have these issues where we kind of only get our own opinions shown to us all the time uh alan is that a final thought do you guys do you need to go yeah give us a final thought before you yeah, yeah i think just to maybe back up what mikey's saying is that um you know, I read a thing yesterday that said, life is short, I want to spend it fighting with people on the internet. <laughs> and I think we need more things like this, uh, just listening to people instead of just talking and, and reading mm. rubbish. So, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Alan. Leaving us on a great final thought. We've also got a new person, two new people at the table. Can you tell me your names? Uh, Sorry, just say it a little bit louder into the mic. Raphael. Raphael. Thank you, Raphael. And we've got over here... Hi, I'm P. 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 Brilliant. So, um, well, I mean, where are we going to go from this, guys? Have you got a, a thought, Matilda? Um, yeah, like um, he said that um, we don't always have to believe in social media because sometimes people just ma just make themselves look like someone else to think that other people won't judge them. Mm, but mm -hmm. it's not actually how you look like on social media, but how you actually look like in real life. Because it doesn't really matter what you look like, because we're all the same, in a way. In a way, yes. No, I, mean, I think that's a good point. But why do you think there's a, do you feel like there's a pressure for people to like look different or, or act different than they actually are on social media? Um, yeah, because some people just love the internet and think <laughs> that's their life. <laughs> Um, but it's really not. Mm, okay, no, I think that's good. So, like, we have lots of people who say, "Oh, they love the internet. That's their life." You know, some lots of people have careers from it, uh, but it's not. It's not their life, or or is it? I don't know. Kat, you wanted to jump in on yeah, that. Yeah, I think what you were saying is really true. Like, I think people sometimes feel like they have to act differently on the internet. Maybe they have to perform like a larger than life version of themselves. Um, and I think that can be really detrimental because it kind of feeds into the echo chambers that we were talking about and the disagreements where people might um, have one kind of political opinion and really perform that on the internet and perform it to the, the furthest extent that they can and have this uh, bravado and really become a pantomime of themselves. And I feel like that doesn't help with division because on one side you can look at someone else and say like oh look at that person they're acting like so silly and seem so out of touch and it's just because everyone is kind of performing their role in a way and yeah no one is really mm. their true selves on the internet or at least not not usually on social media so we're all performing maybe it's a social media maybe it's just a game i don't know uh what was it can you introduce your name first of all Hi, I'm Alex. Alex, there we go. And over here as well. Hi, oh, I'm Chris. Chris. And is there anyone else? I haven't. No, I think I've got everyone's names. Uh, Raphael, did you have a thought? Did you have a hand up that you want to say something? I think people just put the good bits of their life on social media to 
try and distract themselves and others from the bad bits of their life. Oh, okay, yeah. So they maybe... might have family issues or they might be lonely or stuff. So they might just only put the good bits of their life on social media. That's quite a good point, yeah, because I mean, you know, it might, it puts it, it might cheer them up, it might cheer other people up. So people, there's maybe a pressure that people just put their, their good bits of their life on social media. I think humans have just evolved too far. They've gone too far. They've evolved too far, did you say? Yes. Evolved too far. Uh, oh, there we go. You've got some sinister sounds there. Uh, maybe because a big topic has been introduced to the table. Uh, Mikey, do you want to respond to humans evolving too far? Well, I mean, I actually think we're de-evolving. I think we're actually becoming more and more just a node in the network and less thinking for ourselves. So I think we're actually, in a way, we're becoming more efficient. I think the future human, if they keep evolving, will just be, you know, like two very dexterous thumbs um, and, you know, the rest of the hands will just become a kind of iPhone holding case. Oh, okay, um, yeah. So I actually think we're de-evolving and we, we, you know, I don't know how to stop this. It's just inevitable where the computers are becoming more intelligent, we're becoming less intelligent. Okay, so Mike says we're de-evolving, we're becoming less intelligent. Uh, we've got loads of thoughts here. I'm going to go back to the you and then over here. I think we're all hungry for power and we want to be better than everyone else. Okay, oh, interesting. So, and you think that's why sort of, because we had Raphael's point about, you know, putting social media is good. Maybe you think that actually we're hungry for power, that's how we're using social media. Okay, so Matilda, have you got thoughts on that as well? Um, also speaking as a sm about social media, it's also like... Some people see on social media, wow, I want to be that person. I mm -hmm. wish I could change because they're so perfect. But in real life, that person is just faking it mm -hmm. and making um, stuff up. Ex yeah, mm -hmm. for example, saying their family, um, they're using a background and say their family just moved to anywhere um, and then they're actually staying in a really bad place. Mm, but they've like they're presenting a, a different reality online as well. You got kind of like an X sound from uh, um, Mikey over there. I'm going to go, Katie. You had some thoughts over there. I don't think that people have changed at all. I, I don't think that we're evolving that much, and I don't think we have for like hundreds of thousands of years. I think the same impulses that like did us well when we were living in small groups the way you, you care about how people think about you in a small group that makes a lot of sense those people you're relying on each other and you're working together to make sure you survive but those same impulses are quite toxic when all of a sudden it's like the whole world is watching you so um i think we haven't changed and i don't think we're changing that much mm. so you think our natural our natural instincts sort of our more animal instincts are affecting how we behave on social media but may, maybe not for a good thing Raphael. i i agree with mikey cuz i feel like oh you can't get a tick for that <laughs> i feel like people they become obsessed with the internet so then when there's things like cookies and terms of agreement there's like they don't even think about it. They just want to get to doing what they want to do. Mm. Like they don't want to read through anything. They just so they just instantly just click agree no matter what it says. Uh, so you think actually the internet's kind of we're so reliant on the internet. We're so addicted to it. We are, we often agree to a lot of things that we actually don't really want to happen, but we don't care. And we're not we're not mm -hmm. thinking our decisions through. We're being less careful now. Okay, I like that. So not, the internet is quite addictive, so we're not quite thinking our decisions through as a result. I'm going to go to Chris over here. Yeah, I'm going to leave you, so I just sort of like to add something just because it's been brilliant sitting listening to you all. Um, I think everybody seems to be, it's quite interesting, as a group there seems to be a consensus that social media doesn't seem to be overall a force for good. Mm. Um, and although it does have some positive aspects, which is <laughs> the reason why it's popular, we can't deny that, um, it's quite encouraging to hear people recognise the problems with it, especially some of the younger people sitting around the table. So maybe there is hope for us yet, who knows. Okay, so actually, so you're just saying actually, the fact that people are so sceptical and thank you, was that your final thought, That's Chris? Final thought, thank yeah. you very much, yeah. brilliant. If you all, brilliant, you've got a, a real life happen as well. Um, yeah, so we think, Chris is sort of saying, it sounds like everyone here doesn't like social media and that's actually quite a good thing. Uh, do you people agree? Alex, you're looking sceptical. And then I've got these, uh, got Matilda. And what's your name again? 
Matthew, thank you. I don't know. I think it, yes, it can be a bad place, but I think mm. a lot more of it is becoming better. You know, even things like, you know, I work on, on social media, so I'm always on there. And I see so many videos of people going, this is not my face, you know, and they like swap to what their face actually looks like. So I think it is changing. And I hope it changes quicker than it is, but I think it is changing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a, it's still being used to kind of call out the issues and the, the problems with social media. So Matthew and Matilda, you both had thoughts. I think everyone wants to be like the first one to make or create the thing. Like they want to be the best at everything. Mm -hmm. They want to be better than this person. And do you think that do you think that's like a human instinct, or do you think that's something that's just about social media? I think that's with both, mm. because on social media you always show off what you have and how you're better in all, all the other ways, and other people. But in real life, you're you're doing both. You show off what you have and you, what you don't have to your best friends. So okay, yeah, so you sort of do it, you do it both anyway, so it's just, you're just doing it in a different place. Um, also, more people are going onto social media and um, stopped realising how important it also is to read books. Oh, okay. And so, you, wh why, why do you think, do you think there's a difference between reading social media or reading words in a book? Um, yeah, because um, on... Reading a, with reading a book, you don't really have a screen right in front of you instead of reading on your phone, which is a lot less easier mm. because all you have to do is swipe up. But also, um, it's also really, it also is really a damaging thing to your eyes because you don't always have to be on it mm. every single time, even if you have to work with it. You've got quite a lot of nods around the table, so I'm going to go over to Cat uh, here. But just, just before I do, I've got a couple of new people at the table. What's your name? Um, Indra. Indra? Yeah, Indra. Brilliant. And I'm going to go over to Cat over here. I just wanted to speak to a thing Matthew said um, about how people show off on social media, but they also might show off to their friends in real life. And I guess that brings up a point of like, we have talked a lot about the negative sides of social media, but also it's meant that I can really connect with my friends in a way that I might have lost touch with them, especially like with the pandemic where we couldn't see people in person for a long time. I think it was super useful to be able to talk to them. Like I mostly talk to my friends on things like Facebook or I'd send them a funny picture on Instagram, that kind of thing. So like there are a lot of ills and a lot of negatives, but it has also let me stay connected with people who I already knew and connect with people who I didn't know as well, who have similar interests to me. So, yeah, it's so in some ways. It, it's, a, it's a dilemma because we're connected to people. We've always got a dilemma because Raphael's going to leave us, but he's going to leave us with a final thought. So I think, yeah, like Matilda was saying, when you're reading, you learn new vocabulary and stuff, but like on social media, everyone just uses simple words that you don't, mm -hmm. like, everyone already knows those words. Because like, people on social media want to make it as obvious and as bright as possible so that everyone can read and know what they're posting oh in a book you can learn new words and mm -hmm. learn more things i think that's a great final thought to leave us on so yeah the idea that actually social media books you learn maybe new words and books social media everyone uses the same thoughts brilliant that's a brilliant final thought thank you Raphael. if you're wondering what's going on come and grab a seat guys we're talkyoki with a pop-up talk show but i'm going to go to pay over here because you had some thoughts on that yeah, um, I think it's really like dependent on how people use it. Like you can use it both for like the positives of connecting with people or reconnecting with people even. Mm. But if you don't really control how you use it, that's when it starts to slide downhill. So it's really dependent on like your ability to use social media to your benefit. Ah, yeah, and I like that idea you say like, it really depends on your like sort of need of how you control it and you know, can you control it? You need to go, thank you, that was a brilliant final thought. Thank you, Pei. Um I'm gonna give a wonderful round of applause. Brilliant. Oh, um, I, just, <laughs> like, like you said, uh, I just want to put to the table, maybe showing off is actually a good thing because you're actually you know, people talk about virtue signalling, but actually if you are saying you know, I do this, I'm doing this for the environment, you know, whatever. 
I'm, to, you know, I'm thinking this kind thought or this kind of like progressive thought. That's a kind of virtue signaling, but and you're showing off, mm. but it's actually got a good element to it because you're actually moving society forward. So I don't think all showing off is necessarily bad. You can show off in a good way. Go look at this song I made about the people suffering in Ukraine, which is kind of showing off, but it's also highlighting what's happening around the world. Brilliant. That's great. I'm going to go over to Matilda here. I've got Ahmed, I've got Matthew. I've got some new people that I'm going to come to you soon. Don't worry. I also agree with Mikey because, like, um, if you show off in a good way... I'll speak the mic a little bit close to you so you can hear. It means you actually care. Let's say if you um, make a song about Ukraine, um, it means it shows that you actually care and that you're not really boasting about mm -hmm. what you're singing. Because sometimes people make it so that the internet are like, oh, yeah, you care so much. But in real life, you're like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so you're sort of agreeing with Mikey. Yeah, it's that, that element of showing off, actually. If it's, if it's for a good cause, if it's for doing something that uh, is helping people, then it's, then it's a good thing. I'm going to go to Ahmed because you have his hands up, and then Matthew. So, as Matthew said, I'm um, sorry. As I said, building society, I mean, is, I mean, showing off is really important towards building society. Just like showing off on Instagram what she says, that people show off in Instagram, I mean, on the social media. Mm -hmm. it's, it's important because they, build, they have to build the page. And when you show off, that gets into the limelight. So that's important. So uh, not a, not a, another thing to be uh, taken, like you said, they don't care. So just <laughs> live like that. When you think it's show off. <laughs> mm. Okay, so about you, maybe even if they don't really care, it doesn't really matter. I think I did say I was going to go to Matthew as well, but, but before I do, can you tell me your names, please, just very quickly? My name's Amber. Amber? Uh, I'll go with Matt, seeing as Matt. I'm Ah, okay, there we go. We've got Matthew and Matt. There we go, Matthew. I think if the whole world stopped using electronics for one week, like, all of the electronics in the world, like, you can use them for a whole week, mm -hmm. Some people's first instincts would try to make something that could stop this and like make you use it again. But I think you'd make much more friends in real life and in person because in real life and in person you make much more friends because you're face to face and they won't say anything, they wouldn't say to you face to face like cyber bullies. Mm. But bullies, they would, and they would not care at all. And you make much more friends. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's quite a few things to unpack there because I, I was quite, I was quite excited as well. If you're like, oh, could you, could you live a week without electronics? Then there's that sort of difference between, you know, how people interact online with each other, uh, how do they do in real life? I can't tell you where to go with the conversation. You guys have to. So uh, I'm going to go to Cat. Um, Alex, before you go, give us your final thought. <laughs> Stay true, stay real on social media. Oh, stay true, stay real. Before Alex goes, what is your job? Oh, yes. I work for an online tutoring company, but it, we, you know, to promote it, we use social media. There you go. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alex. A round of applause for you. Uh, Come and get, grab a seat, guys. Come and get involved. This is Talkyoki. It's a pop-up talk show. You guys are our VIP guests. You guys are our VIP guests. Grab a seat. Um, we've got a few new people, so I'm going to do um, a round of names. Uh, Katarina. Katarina. Ayana. Ayana. Um, so... I'm going to get, give you your name first, and I'll come back to you. Matilda. Matilda. Matthew. Indra. Indra. Uh, a lady in the black coat, come and, come and grab a seat. Come and join in. <laughs> What's your name? Noga. Noga? Yeah. Uh, Matt. Matt. Amber. Amber. Mikey. Katie. Kat. Uh, and Matilda, you are going to make a good point. Um, so, as a lot of people use social media for their works, mm. say they use it, as Alex used it, for online tutoring, they and also in sorry, in cyberbullying, you wouldn't say it face to face because it would just be um, really harsh. Mm. And but if you're doing real bullying face to face, and then you 
punch someone, but then you tell the teacher that he that the other person punched you, that would just be lying to the teacher's face. Mm. So you can you can have fake news online or um, in person as well. Yeah. And and there's sort of different. I guess like well, there, there's different ways to to, to interact to bully people uh, depending on whether you're in real life or online. Yeah, because um, if you were on if you were bullying someone online, mm -hmm. um, you couldn't do you could if someone was bullying you. I'm gonna online, I'm gonna pause you, Matilda. Before you guys go, okay. um, this is Talkyoki. We've been discussing a lot of debates here. We've been discussing like uh, how we behave on uh, online, offline. Um, before you guys go, can you give us a topic that we're going to discuss on the table, or just some thoughts on what you've heard so far? Oh God. Uh all my topics are not good children. <laughs> oh, what have you seen tonight? What's good to check out on the rest of the... the there you go, you've got a sad clown noise. from. Why are, all dip, why are all deep sea fish so ugly? Okay, brilliant. Why are all the deep fish so ugly? Uh, a thought from you as well? Throw it into the table. Um, I just avoid social media as much as I can. Oh, interesting. And just take a break from it if it's too hard. Okay, so we're going to avoid social media. Uh, Mike, I'm going to go over here and then... Oh, I just want to pick up on Matthew's idea about like going on a sort of one-week electronics fast. Mm. I don't think we could last that long. I don't think we... It's like, you know, I've got next door to me uh, is like the chicken shop and they're a Muslim in there and they do Ramadan where they fast for a month. I tried it for like half a day and that's about as much as I could do and I think it's the same with social media you I don't think we could last for that kind of length of time oh. but I think it's probably really healthy for us but maybe start off with an hour or two hours yeah. Okay, so we need to do a bit of fasting from the internet, but we don't really think that we could uh, leave it for that long. You don't think you could give up electronics that long. Uh, Matthew, you introduced this ton concept of suggesting we all get rid of our electronics, get rid of the internet for a week. Uh, you've got a point, and could you do it? Um, I think I could. Mm -hmm. I would be really annoyed that it's taken away, but yes, I could, because I would just go to the park, maybe make some new friends and make like I uh, have have more interactions and more people to talk with if you're sad and lonely and if you're depressed like you have friends so you, you think it's better like even if you were sort of like cut off from everyone actually you think your human kind of instincts would like override it and you would just find people to make friends with exactly yeah. Brilliant. Indra, you had a point a bit earlier that I want to go to, and then I'll come, come here. I know lots of people have got any thoughts, so do put your hand up if you want to throw something in as well. Um, this is kind of derailing it, but it was about the all right. deep sea fish. So. Oh, yeah, no, they're throwing the sea fish. I thought do we'd they have the sea fish. <laughs> um, uh, this feels like totally random now. But no, I'm no, just no, gonna no say, bring it in. We like random um, there. Okay, okay. I don't know, maybe it's because it's like so dark down there, they just can't see each other, so they don't know how ugly they are. And oh, <laughs> yeah. So maybe there's some evolutionary kind of pressure uh, to not look as attractive, so uh, that's why they're ugly. And maybe they're beautiful to each other. That was. Oh, point. maybe they're beautiful to each other. Okay, so I mean, lots of things. And we've got so many thoughts here. I've got Mikey as well. I'm going to go Mikey first, and then I'm going to go I to mean, one yeah, of you two. I, I, I just think it's just different environments, isn't it? Yeah. They're probably all down there going, I went once went up to the surface. Man, they were ugly up there. <laughs> they were so ugly. They all had these smooth faces and, you know, and they're very symmetrical looking, you know. They probably thought that well, they probably think we look ugly. Okay. Yeah. Do we look ugly to other animals? I'm going Matilda and then Matthew. Um, we like Matthew said. Um, he, um, you can give up an electronic for a week because mm -hmm. in our school we um had to give up something for Lent in our four re weeks. Mm -hmm. Well, four week for four weeks. And you gave up you gave up uh, electronics for Lent or no, the he gave I gave up electronics. He gave watch he gave up watching the TV. That okay. did not work That's out. Horrible idea. <laughs> um, so most of our friends gave up the <laughs> sugar and stuff like that, mm -hmm. which is because um, which is what they think is really nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, so. But like we could all give up something um, for four weeks um, yeah. or five um, and then realize that it's not 
it's better to give up something and then not have it for that long mm, mm -hmm. instead of having it for that long um, say if you're if you work on um, online you could li you could maybe do something else mm. on paper instead Okay, okay, like, like that. So a bit like Mikey's thought earlier, you know, like there's this thought that maybe it's a bit healthier if we do something, uh, if we can give it up, that we're not relying on it, maybe that we're not addicted to it. So we've got that kind of need to sort of give stuff up, um, balancing off. I'm going to go to Kat and then I'm going to Matthew. And also, if you haven't had a thought and you haven't thrown it in yet, do wave at me because we can bring in some new thoughts. Like, okay, Amber, you've been thrown in. <laughs> I mean, I wanted to skip back very quickly and uh, speak up on behalf of deep sea creatures because they are beautiful. And I think we are applying human beauty standards to these lovely, interesting animals that we don't know anything about. And uh, I think they're all beautiful in their own way. I just wanted to skip back to that very quickly. So, no, that's all right. So, Kat's bringing back up to a sort of beauty standard. So, thinking about how, what is attractive, what do animals find attractive, what do we find attractive. Maddie, you got a point, I think, on social media. But Amber, because we haven't heard from you, I'm just going to get you bring a new voice. The table. I'm, I'm just going to jump on the uh, the beauty thing because I agree. I think what is attractiveness, what is beautiful. I think we've, as a, humans, we've kind of set up our own idea of what attractiveness is, and maybe those those fishes are beautiful. That is all. <laughs> maybe those fishes are beautiful. Uh, Matthew, you've been very patient. Thank you very much. We've been talking about online. We've been talking about what we find attractive, what humans find attractive, what animals find attractive. What does social media find attractive? I'm going to go to the ocean and how we're mm -hmm. taking away all of the fish that we've barely even studied yet. So there's so much living in the deep mm -hmm. and we haven't figured out anything. Because most of the people are looking at the stars in space because they're always thinking, oh, space is infinite, we can find infinite things. But there's still things on this planet that we haven't discovered yet and we could still figure out. So, mm. we could go back further and the planet could be m more than four billion years old and there could be more than just dinosaurs and pterodactyls and... I think this is where we get the kind of slightly <laughs> sinister music coming in. I know, I like it. So, you're and saying that, that, that kind of like... I feel like what you're saying, you know, there's a, we have a lot of like research in space, we have a lot of research in the natural world. Maybe we're a bit too focused on space and technology. Maybe we need to focus a little bit more on the natural world. And I think dinosaurs could just be something else entirely. And dinosaurs, like, ah, okay, not brilliant. Have carnivals. you guys got final thoughts? I'm going to take that as your final thought. Matilda, do you want to add anything onto that final thought? Um, he also makes a point that. Um, Maybe we haven't discovered everything. Okay, yeah. And there are still a few different creatures that we have to still discover. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Matthew Matilda, thank you so much for bringing a new topic to the conversation. Have a lovely rest of your late. Uh, we've got a few spare seats, guys. So if you'd like to join Talk Yoki, it's a pop up talk show where you guys are the VIPs, everyone here. Uh, grab a seat, bring us a topic, a thought, get involved. Um, as we've got a few new people on the table, I'm going to do a really, really quick round of names just so we get to know each other. I'm Evie in the middle. Oh, Katarina. Katarina. Ayana. Ayana. Bubs. Bubs. Brick. Brick. Indra. Indra. Kirit. Kirik. Yeah. Dana. Dana. Matt. Matt. Amber. Amber. Mikey. Katie. Kat. Brilliant, fantastic, everyone. Um, so we were kind of we were sitting in the Natural History Museum saying, are we spending too much time on space research? We talked about ugly fish. Mikey's got loads of thoughts. He wants to say. Uh, I just wanted to say, talking about uh, research, they recently found out that the clams that we, well, that I'm vegetarian, so I'm above that, but <laughs> the clams that we eat in a clam chowder are two to four hundred years old, um, and they only found this out relatively recently in the in the last twenty years. Um, so that just goes to show the sea research isn't really there, it's, and that's just shallow things. So stuff that's a bit deeper, you know, we really don't know much about it down there. So we don't even know much about how what we eat. You've got a lot of nods from Kat over here. I mean, I did a bit of marine biology at uni, so I think it is so important to study the ocean, especially because we're changing it so much at the moment. Like, the ocean is acidifying, it's warming up as well, so we don't even understand the species that are already there and the, the makeup of, uh, like, the diversity of the ocean at the moment. 
So we're not ever going to understand how it's going to change. So yeah, it's something that we really need to focus on and I think would be so important to understand more of as it is changing and how to prevent that change as well. You've got a tick from Mikey, so you must have done well. Uh, do people agree? Do people disagree? Um, do, do we need to spend more time doing, um, on researching our Earth? Do we really care? Where are we going to take this, guys? Any thoughts? There we go. I've got Katie over here. Mine's a fi final thought. I'm just throwing it in there. Oh, that's okay. Because bringing you back to deep sea fish um, and whether they're attractive or not, and whether other animals find us attractive. Um, I think probably not, because like if beetles found us attractive, we'd always be trying to hump our legs. Um, but I would just wonder, maybe maybe deep sea creatures smell amazing because oh. they can't see each other. It doesn't matter how they look. Maybe they smell amazing, as well as like all the lights down there. I, I reckon that's that's probably really amazing too. Um, and I'm going to thank leave you the very table. much, Katie. Thank, thank you for a great final thought to leave us on. Uh, if you guys are intrigued, come and grab a seat. Come and get involved. Uh, we've been talking about yeah. What we find attractive, we've been talking about social media, we've been talking about um, Brick. Yeah. What have we been talking about? Uh, uh, we are Talkie Oki, we're a pop up talk show, uh, and everyone here is just a guest. You guys can, have a, uh, can join as well. Uh, and we're just sort of talking about whatever you guys want to talk about. Come and, come and grab a seat. Uh, Brick, let us know your thoughts uh, yeah, in the meantime. Yeah, so um, the last thing that uh, our last person said, you know, mentioned, you know, uh, wondering about the smells like the deep sea. One of, mm. I think, the coolest recent, uh, I love astronomy, astronomical observations is that uh, we actually can replicate the smells of the universe um, because we can recognize, you know, via, uh, you know, light analysis, the chemical compounds that make up, you know, glass clouds and nebula. And so we can actually replicate the smells of space, Ooh. even though it's, like, not really a concept that, like, makes sense, uh, just because because like, we can understand what the universe is made of. Uh, wow. That's super cool stuff. Okay, so that, that's a great spot, a good point in. Come and grab a seat if you fancy. Um, because we now know a bit more about, we, the astronomers now got to the point where they can uh, work out what space smells like. Um, do we want this more kind of research like this, Indra? Oh, I just had a question. So, um, I mean, would the conditions of space affect the way that those compounds smell? Like, would we be able to smell what space smell, smells like in space? <laughs> uh, have you got an answer, Rick? Yeah. Um, so I'm not an astronomer, uh, only amateur. Um, as I understand it, like, so like smell and sound are not concepts that like really work in space, like as we understand them here on Earth, because all of those are mediated by like our very like aerosol uh, and like you know high hydrogen nitrogen atmosphere. So like the idea that like the universe smells in the sense that, like you could take off your helmet and smell things doesn't make like a whole lot of sense, but like mm. it's kind of like a. Uh, a replication of that. So, like something we also do is um, you can he you can replicate a sound pattern that like quasars make because these are stars that like circle uh, uh, that orbit super super quickly, um, and they don't make sound per se because there's nothing really for sound waves to bounce off of. But you can like create simulations of like what a sound would be like. Mm, okay, so we're making we can yeah you can make simulations of what sound, space might sound smell like. Can I just get your 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 name and a thought if you've got one? Oh, uh, not on the exact one with space and smell. Uh, I'm Mukilin, um, and I'm a PhD student. So, yeah. uh, in the in the sm in the sound of space or the smell of space. Oh. What's your PhD in? Uh, neuroscience. Oh, oh, okay, brilliant. So if you've got some, any kind of neuroscience themed questions, bring them here. Mikey? I would like to know if the universe smells the same in all directions, or is there a spectrum of smells, in which case is the universe actually isotropic? Meaning, is it the same in all directions? Okay, so mm. does it smell in the same in all, all I directions? I mean, it might smell of strawberries to the east and more of kind of chocolate to the west. Yeah. And will we yeah. all smell the same thing? Well, that, well that's another good, that's what we ask the neuroscientists, <laughs> don't we? Yeah. That's a question. Where, where are we going to take this, guys? We've got, we've got some great ideas on the table. Uh, there we go. No, uh, on that point, I think the, it, it should be something like the one from Futurama, where you mm -hmm. have a smellometer and you kind of like look around in space and you smell different things. That would be amazing. <laughs> ah, okay, brilliant. So, uh, get, do you think that's possible? Do you think that technology could be real one day? Oh, as a neuroscientist. Um, of course, because uh, different senses can be replicated. Mm -hmm. And uh, right now, there has been complete developments with uh, taste, for example. And uh, in Japan, for now, uh, they have been uh, developing screens which you can lick 
and you can feel the taste so oh might be a possibility um, you'll be looking on to your um, what do you call it like your uh, smartphones but mm -hmm. not good with covid so yeah. don't well, please don't do that <laughs> absolutely you got you got a burp sound effect from the talkie okay table we're not quite at the taste sound effect yet uh, we might get there soon um, so yeah there may be you know, do we want to live in a future with tv or um, i should dare say video games with taste and smell and sound in the same way that we uh, consume media now do we think this is a, a waste of time good research where are we going to go I mean, I think sort of an extension of virtual reality where you include more of it, because virtual reality is mainly um, visual and then sound. I think expanding it uh, within, a, within limitations, like nobody wants to smell horrible smells. But if you're, if you're doing a video game and you're in a cave and you also smell a bit of that dampness in the underground, I think that would really add to the virtual reality experience. So I think it's worth, like, a technology worth developing. Uh, and people are going to complain if it's, you know, too smelly anyway. So they'll limit, they'll limit the extremities uh, as it is. So I think that's a good thing to do. Okay, so maybe, uh, is this the future of video games? Is this a demand that we're waiting to happen? I think it's also interesting for online shopping when you are like, uh, buying Ooh. perfume or something. So, yeah. Uh, so yeah, Catherine, you're throwing out sort of taste, smell, sound. Some, well, you can get some of those from online shopping. Uh, maybe not taste, maybe not feel, perhaps. I'm just wondering if they, they do incorporate smell into video games. Will there be like certain smells that are censored that are like 15 or 18 smells <laughs> um, that children are not allowed to smell? I don't, I don't know. Just a question. Just a question. Does anyone have an answer or a thought? I'll go Indra and then Kerik. Um, that was unrelated, but um, <laughs> what I'm about to say is unrelated to that, I mean. <laughs> we love a tangent here at Tokyo. <laughs> That's absolutely fine. I was just going to say, maybe it could make some experiences a lot more accessible. For example, like going on holiday, like you could just have like a virtual reality experience of being in another country with like smells and stuff from that country. Mm. Oh, brilliant, I like that. So but actually if we keep working on a multi-sensory VR, you actually might make a lot more experiences uh, more accessible. I like that. Carrot. Yeah, I just want to counter that uh, mm. by saying the human contact, you know, the smile, the mm -hmm. eye contact, would you get that in any of these virtual uh, formats? Well, yeah, do you think it's possible? You know, how do we get that same, can we get that same sort of human contact, body language um, from virtual, uh, virtual reality and games? Kat, you, you're nodding. That is, yeah, it's interesting. It's like whether you would be, if you did like have a virtual holiday or something, whether that would be an, as, obviously it wouldn't be as real an experience and it's also curated by someone else. Like someone would have to program that and make it. So like it would be a really cool way to experience things. Like if you weren't able to like monetarily or for whatever other reason, like you'd be able to experience things, but also it wouldn't be as real and someone else would have decided that experience for you. It's a, it's a weird mm. one. Okay, so there's also this, uh, who is, who's programming these experiences as well? Brick. Uh, yeah, um, so you know, Facebook's big shift to meta was like kind of predicated on this idea that... <laughs> A sinister sound from the sound desk, sir. I agree. <laughs> um, was predicated on this idea that like uh, there is a, a really big need for like VR, especially in like the workplace and socializing. Um, but something I think we've really seen in lockdown and why we're all here in person, I think, uh, is that there's a whole lot of screen fatigue. Uh, and I have a very hard time thinking that like as especially like as the technology currently exists and like can be foreseen to exist, that people will actually want to dawn a VR headset for more than a couple hours hours at a time. Mm. It's, uh, do people agree? Do have people have different thoughts on this? Okay. I mean, I would definitely agree on that because uh, fatigue on some kind of, uh, it can be emotional, it can be also physical strains and it can keep on going and it kind of like, uh, we have a certain peak and over then it, it plateaus. So you don't feel anything more, it's just annoyance. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah. everyone knows the feeling that when they are in Zoom anymore mm -hmm. and they still constantly check whether they have their mic on or they have their camera on and they don't want to be be bothered. So we don't want that anymore. So that kind of, it's an evolving situation, I would say. Evolving situation, although it seems that people are, are not that positive about Zoom, about VR experiences around the table. Is that right? Or do you have different opinions on that? 
I don't know. There we go. We've got Matt is sort of thinking, but he's not entirely sure. Uh, what's the last point? <laughs> that, that's all right. Bring in your point. Uh, we, we can go for an ADHD tandem. Um, <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I, I actually I work uh, for a company where we're a startup that does uh, acceleration in NFTs and blockchain and metaverse. Uh, if we're talking about thinking and perception of stuff, uh, Facebook's move to Meta is genius because people were onboarding that have never touched the space. When we say metaverse, like, oh, that's the thing done by Facebook, and we're like, no, but it's an excellent move by the uh, robot Zuckerberg. Uh, <laughs> I, I put the question out of what do people see as the future of like VR or the metaverse or even do you see a value in digital assets or fashion? Mm, okay, brilliant. So, I mean, loads of things there we can go for. Matt says he's sort of working for a startup that's working with NFTs. That's quite exciting. Is there this future in the... Uh, he, oh, he's not so sure if it's exciting. Uh, is there a future in this virtual world? Is it something to invest in? Uh, where, where are we going to go with this topic? Kat, you want, you, you want to say something? Go on. I feel like I'm talking too much. <laughs> Apologies. Um, it's interesting with VR. So I have a lot of friends who are game designers. Um, and I think there was a thought that VR was really going to catch on a few years ago. And it never really did. And there was a discussion about augmented reality versus virtual reality and which one was going to be picked up and neither of them have been really because VR headsets are still really expensive there's not really a way to try them out especially like with COVID you can't try them out at the moment really and I know people get, like I've tried it out I get very motion sick with it so it's mm. a technology which is really interesting and has the potential to change a lot of things but if it's never picked up by the majority of people, it's never really going to go anywhere, despite like people who are really bought into it, no matter how much they talk about it. It's potentially not going to come to anything. I don't know. Okay, so a bit sceptical about whether it's actually going to sort of take off, despite the excitement. I think it's a little bit like 3D movies, you know. Oh. 3D movies have been around since the 60s, but they've always been there. Um, and like a lot of the superhero films are in th now in 3D, but it doesn't really add anything to the film, I don't think. Mm, okay. So it doesn't add anything to the film? It's a bit like, yeah, or maybe like a 3D book. Why would you have it? You know, it's like, it's a novelty. It's a novelty, it's a blip. Um, but people are making a lot of money off it. Um, I think it was Brick who said something about meta and the fact that um, it was maybe very wisely chosen, the metaverse. Uh, yeah, I mean, so, yes, uh, I, I am unabashedly and, and uh, unapologetically like biased against crypto and, and <laughs> NFTs in the meta space and no personal offense uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but what uh, it you know like Bitcoin has been around since 2009 now and the big mm -hmm. problem it has is that it's been around for almost uh, you know 15 you know years and it's never really found a use case you know like the first use case it had was like a legal drug dealing and then when they shut down Silk Road uh, using Bitcoin to buy NFTs was kind of the big use case. And it's, 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 it's had a very long time at this point to find a use case. And like as something that's meant to be a revolutionary technology, uh, if it was going to find a use case people found useful, you'd think it would have found it by now. Brilliant. So Brick's saying, actually, although there's all this Bitcoin around, there's a new things, ways to use it, NFTs, actually, it hasn't really got a future. Um, we've got, remind me of your name again. Oh, Mukilin. Mukilin. Yeah. So uh, regarding this one, it's like I can see the both sides of the argument, <laughs> but I think crypto itself has its space, uh, mostly from uh, different countries which have like more closed economies. For example, uh, uh, China was developing its own uh, the uh, digital yuan. India is also trying it uh, to have a follow up of it, and it doesn't have the biases as. Uh, Western countries do have on privacy itself, mm. so in which a government is all seeing and all pervasive. So it has its use case, but the original concept uh, that people were saying with Bitcoin itself is the decentralization part. But mm. how much into effect that would be is a great question, but there are different proof of concept. Uh, items that are still available which has low energy intake like proof of stake but these things are still in progress yes brilliant I'm gonna I just want to go because we've got a new person on the table can you just let us know your name please 
My name is Zaid. Zaid. And Zaid, do you have any thoughts on what we've just been discussing? Before I go to Mikey, uh, have you got opinions on people using Bitcoin? Uh, do you think it's going to affect your life? Uh, so, like you've been s saying, like, like people, like people have recently f tried to find find a use case, but um, if it really had a good use case, it sh it would have been used by now. Mm, okay, yeah. So, I mean, I think some link points to that. So you're saying, yeah. is there a use case? We've got like, well, maybe it's been established in some if, small areas, but it's uh, not that useful. So, like, so like, if it's, if it's very, so if it's, it's very useful, then it's then it. Then after, then immediately after it was invented, like people would find it, people would find the, the fun, a function or a use case for it. But since they haven't really found, found it, mm. there we go. We've got Mikey over there, and I think also I might have missed Matt, who maybe works in a, in a connected field and might have some opinions that he wants to put back. I in. mean, if you go to someone like Venezuela, where they've got a plummeting currency, Bitcoin is very popular mm. because. It's if you earn money and you keep it in your currency, it just goes down the. It just goes that you, you've got to really spend it almost mm -hmm. instantly before it devalues. So I think there are quite compelling use cases for Bitcoin and for other cryptocurrencies. I, I think 12 years or 13 years is not enough mm -hmm. actually to really explore it, but probably somebody needs to come up with a better one than Bitcoin or Ethereum. Okay, so maybe maybe it's like a proof of concept in a hundred years, for example. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I can I can uh, give you a real world use case. So you were talking about Ukraine earlier, uh, and everyone's heard about people trying to get out of Ukraine and stuff like that. Uh, one of the places. Oh, the, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, the, no, the, no, the, no. Uh, the, yeah. the timing would have been wrong for that. So one of the things I've been working with is uh, ethnic minority students and universities getting out of Ukraine. One of the things we saw <laughs> um, Hold it for a second. <laughs> was the second that, arguably not government broke down, but uh, belief in the country's sovereignty broke down that affects currency. So we were trying to get students out of a country where you can't send them cash because banking means nothing anymore. You go to an ATM. They don't care. Mm. Uh, that's also the first thing I say to people. They're like, oh, your, your crypto money's worth nothing. Currently in the States and Ukraine, if you go to a cash machine, your fiat currency is worth nothing. So without uh, blockchain, I think cryptocurrency and blockchain are misconstrued as the same thought or ideology, as it were. Through, through the power of that, we were able to direct funds directly to people in need. Um, and that, that's a really top level use case for it as a currency is, is practically boring. I mean, something like health data, like the NHS, how many times have our, have our GP records been left on a train? Imagine if you had complete control of it, but for something like insurance, you could do a, what's called a zero proof lookup. So you could have your medical conditions, your doctor could see if the medication they're giving you reacts with any of the medications you have without actually knowing what those medications are or conditions, but still without the issue of having uh, negative side effects from that medication. Mm. NFTs, blockchain, and the currency, we're, we're in like 1997, I think is the prediction of where the technology is. The use cases, they will be there. And already, like in the last year, they've changed drastically. Okay, okay, so I mean, lots of things to uh, um, point out there. Just uh, the ability to get people funds when you need to, and then maybe Bitcoin's got a real use in there. I think, Dana, if we got you leaving, can you leave us with a final thought before you go? I don't have a good time. <laughs> well, give us, a, give us a new topic to throw into the to mix whilst you leave. <laughs> Anything at all? I'm boring accountant. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, well, no, but I think there's a. Is your world going to change? Is your world going to change with Bitcoin, as an accountant? Well, at the moment, um, we don't see that much interest in in it. Yes, think people yeah. are just saying that you've got to have a lot of time to watch it, and you've got to have money that you can put away and forget about. That's all I can Brilliant. contribute to. Thank you very much, Donna. There we go. Fantastic. Thank you very much for taking part in Talk Yogi. Um, I've got loads of hands up here. I'm going to go to Gemma. We haven't heard from you yet on this topic. Yes, yeah, so I'm 
I'm not going to say I'm too familiar with how all of that works, but the main thing that has come my way is with the mining of all of that, how much computing power it takes and yes. how absolutely horrific it is for the environment. And also the uh, certain computer parts have just the prices have absolutely, I think it's graphic cards specifically, mm. the prices have absolutely skyrocketed because there's so much of being bought up by these companies doing all of the, the cryptocurrency mining and just the, the amount of compute, they've got fields and fields of computers that need cooling, they need energy, they need electricity. And to me, that alone just makes it like, I don't want to interact with that and I think it should disappear. <laughs> Brilliant. No, I think that's a great point to bring up. So the kind of sort of environmental impact as well. I'm going to go side and then we've got over here as well. So environmental impact of all these technologies. Uh, can, I can I just say, say something about the Bitcoin topic? Uh, you can. Uh, so, like, so like I think one of, the, one of the reasons it hasn't really found a use case is maybe because it's very expensive. So like, so like one, so like, it's only useful for very expensive things, mm. and and like you're not going to often buy very expensive things. But also like, and uh, you're now discussing uh, about technology and the environment. Yes, yeah. So I think I mean I think we might actually you've mm. got quite a lot of points from there already that I might mm. want to pick up on. So just the idea that actually even though Bitcoin might be really helpful, it's decentralised, lots of people can use it. Actually, yes. you have to have a lot of money to get it in the first place. Yes. Yeah, um, Mikey, you wanted to sort of add something onto that. Well, I mean, uh, people don't appreciate how expensive our conventional money system is. It takes a lot of time and, you know, there's a lot of people employed in keeping the gold and the cash uh, secure. There's a lot of people employed in the IT of that system. Um, and, and it actually takes up a lot of time and energy and money. Um, plus, all the guns that come with the, the authority of the sovereign state that Matt was talking about. So, I, I think we need to compare like for like. Um, I mean, I, I was actually, I think that the question of people's data, their money and the environment will all merge into like one mm. kind of currency because it's all a kind of currency really. It's a currency of data, a currency of value and that a currency of the system. So in the end, it's all going to be one thing, I think, in the future. So we're sort of bringing it back almost to, we're, we're bringing it back, we're in the Natural History Museum, we're bringing it back to nature uh, and, and the kind of the impact that our sort of financial systems have. We have some points over here. Oh, the financial system of Bitcoin itself. Or whatever, whatever topic you want to throw in there, I'm sort of kind of doing a bit of a recap just so we know where we are, but um, let us know what you think. Oh, I mean, the main uh, environmental impact is always quite high in mm -hmm. the sense as uh, people were saying in the uh, main as proof of work concept is always using different mining equipments and uh, people have been trying to move into more renewable stuff mm -hmm. like Iceland has been using its own geothermal energy uh, to mine its uh, uh, Bitcoin but in long term things as I was iterating before it's it's a proof of concept yeah I would yeah, say yeah. and uh, again it, it should be reduced and uh, in the future like uh, there's proof of stake concept which is more like running a server yes, and yeah. it's it's much easier and it's yeah. it's more effective I would say <laughs> so yeah before you guys go uh, just give us a couple of thoughts from what you've uh, you kind of sort of had a little chance to listen in uh, what do you guys think of what everything you've heard just now so I agree with a lot of the points but mm. to give like another view about technology being perhaps good. Um, it was quite good to spread sustainability knowledge and get initiatives going because before that I feel like it's easier to to spread like knowledge about how to cut down on like use. Sorry I didn't know what no, the No, 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 it, it, the sound effects, it means that people are agreeing with you, don't oh, okay. worry. <laughs> yeah, so it's been good to spread like positives and like education. Brilliant, thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I mean, I think, I don't know if we've got a natural break here, so we might do a quick swap of the Talkie uh, uh host. Thank you so much for joining. Um, if you please stick around if you want to stay for the second session as well. I've been Evie, uh, we're going to swap slowly to Mikey in the middle. Um, but most importantly, thank you very much for uh, taking part. Give yourselves a round of applause. And see you guys soon around the Talkie table. Thank you. And if you're around, if you're sort of coming around, you're going to really what this is. Grab a seat, we're going to swap hosts and uh, we're going to start a new session of Talkie Aking about 
Five, ten minutes. We've got Antec and we've got... Cat. And... I'll just say my nickname, Cookie. Cookie. You can be whoever you want to be, actually, here. <laughs> so we've got... We've got Cat, we've got Cookie, we've got Antec, we've got... Emma. 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 Yeah. And... Estelle. 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 And over here? I'm Evie. Evie. You're still Evie. And as I said, my name is Mikey. Let's have some few people join. I'm going to come to you in a second, Antec. But what we, the first thing we want to do, I mean, we talked about a lot. It's all been about technology. It's been about, um, it's, it's been about nature. It's been about social media. It's been about artificial intelligence. But, we, you know, we can talk about absolutely anything. There's a, there's a little bit about why are deep sea fish so ugly. Oh. Uh, so we did. We, we went into that, but it's kind of up to you. You can talk about whatever you want to talk about. So it's up to you. Antec, have you got a subject for us? Yes. What would you like to talk about? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to switch the tables around. Yeah. I'm going to give you the talking. Yeah. Until you say something that I disagree. Okay. And then, and then we shall contact, and then I explain why, this, then we disagree, and I explain why I disagree. Yeah. It's excellent debating, well, then we switch on the next person, okay. and then we can do the whole cycle again once the last person okay. has well, been interviewed. Okay, we can do that. i tell you what, you stay there, Ante. If there's something you disagree with, flag me down, and we will find out what your opinion is on that. Um, so, so um, what's that? I... By the way, I'm very right-wing. Uh, well, that's fine. You can be whatever you want to be here on Tokyoki. Um, come and take a seat. So we've got... What, have we got a subject yet? Have we got... Have you got an idea over here? Um, no, I was just thinking... Um, I was thinking about being addicted to social media and then people's, oh, yeah. like, um, animal instincts. And so, yeah. like, if I wasn't addicted to social media, I might be, I don't know, addicted to food or addicted okay, to Okay, so addictions else, so. we could be talking about. Um, we've got a new face over here. What's your name? Charlotte. Charlotte. We've got Evie. We've got Cookie. We have got Ema and Estelle and Antec. Um, my name is Mikey. We're, we're just starting the second session, so we don't have a subject yet. You've come at a perfect time. This is now the time to come and sit down. Um, you can do it. Don't be shy. Um, we're still looking for a subject, though. We've got addictions from Evie. Have you got anything? What? What's the context? It could be actually we talk about absolutely anything. I'll tell you what we've talked about so far tonight. We talked about uh, artificial intelligence. Is it going to take over the world? We talked about um, technology. We talked about social media. We talked about um, Google knowing more about you than you know about you. Then we talked about what did we talk about after that? Come on, you were in the middle. Yeah, no, uh, well, we were talking about Bitcoin, and then we went back to like yeah. uh, like the impact of uh, Bitcoin on nature, yeah. which I think is yeah. quite cool. Like that impact yeah. of technology yeah. on yeah. Uh, yeah how how it works. Okay, so that's a few suggestions, but we can talk about the whole point of Tokyo is It's up to you to decide what you want to talk about. Sit down, Antec. Uh, we've got some new faces over here, so we've got. Uh, Evie, Charlotte, was it? Yeah, uh, we've got Cookie, we've got Ima, 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 and Estelle, Antec, and what's your name? Amara. And? Joe. And? My name's Dean Somali, pleasure to meet you all. <laughs> Just say that a bit slower. My name's Dean Somali, pleasure to meet you all. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and? Jet. Pleasure to meet you as well, by the Zach. way. Zach. Um, we have just started this second session. I've just got in the middle. The seats already been warmed. And tell us your name. Uh, Georgie. 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 But we don't have a subject, really, apart from addictions bit has been offered by, because we are talking about social media early on. But, people, have you got a subject for me? What do you want to talk about? Charlotte, yeah. yeah. Nature versus nurture. Nature versus nurture. But what do you want to say about that? What do you want to say? Uh, do you just want to throw it out there? I want to throw it out there. Okay. I want to start nature's a, you got something there, Cookie? I want to talk about um, gender roles in nature. How like seahorses have more of a mother nature. Okay. Tell and us about seahorses. Um, so I think it's the dad that gives birth. Right. Okay. In in uh, seahorses, it's the dad that gives birth. And there is lots of animals where the male version is like the the nurturing one. In, okay. in the family and I kind of want to talk how nature is like showing these signs but we don't do that in real okay, life. So, oh, okay, gender roles in nature, what do people think? Have, also, have we got any experts here about this? Because we are in the Natural History Museum. You're an expert in gender roles? I'm not an expert but I can tell you tell us it a doesn't bit. matter about gender if you're having a billion angry emus running at you when in the em because that's what the whole war. Let's aim a war! Religion! Okay. Is the Science Museum better than the Natural History Museum? I've got a billion topics! 
Okay. Boys, even. Uh, okay, we're going to get a round of applause for that. Oh, my sound effects machine seems to have gone off there. But anyway, um, okay. So there's a few there's a few subjects here. Gender roles on this. Anyone got anything to say about this? Or? Uh, about gender roles or a new topic? Well, anything. It's up to you, really. I'm curious about objects that look like animals and vice versa. Uh, what? Well, uh, can you give us an example? I don't know. Like you could say, like a shawl, for example, might look like. Uh, a squid or an octopus, for example. Okay. That's just I'm just. Okay, so in a way, that's more like that's more like kind of roles in I'm terms happy. of yeah. I'm happy with that. Okay, well, octopuses can go very deep. Um, okay, yeah, that's a point here from Judy. Yeah, on uh, gender roles, I find yeah. it really interesting that we are one of the only races in the human yeah. races, yeah, in the world yeah. that would be like. If you get attacked by a woman, you're weaker. But if you get bitten by a female shark, no one goes, oh my god, I can't believe you got bitten by a female shark. Okay. Well, like it was suddenly weaker. <laughs> okay, so... All right, so we, I feel like there's a certain group of people that wants to talk about gender roles, and there's certain people that's like, let's talk about the shape of octopuses. Um, so I don't know, is it a subject we want to talk about? As of a show, who wants to talk about gender roles? Uh, who doesn't want to talk about... Uh, okay, go with Evan. Uh, well, no, it was just I, talking mm. more about, I guess, like science and then gender roles. I think there yeah. was an article in the yeah. news... Yeah. In the new site, I think, uh, recently, we're saying that a lot of, like, why female animals are often seen as, like, more maternal, for example, is because yeah. um, a lot of natural history was done by the Victorians, mm -hmm. and they had, like, really strict ideas about mm. what me women and men should do. So, so when they were the writing Victorians. about animals, yeah. and then people read about that, learned that in school, mm. and then when they saw the animals, they're like, oh, yeah, that is a really motherly mm. thing to do from that line. So it was like the, so the, they like, you know, it the, was the like female a penguin is very chaste and pure. I do know yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kind of related, yeah. but I was chatting to someone yesterday at work, and apparently, mm -hmm. this is applicable to kind of the standard person because we all have like cats and dogs at home. Yeah. But she's actually doing like a cat psychology course in yeah. her in yeah in her cat time. psychology yeah, yeah cat knew? psychology course yeah. And she was like, she said, she was like, I always wondered why my cats preferred my husband to me. Right. And it's like a known thing in so science. So are cats that sexist? Is that cats, what you're cats prefer men to women, and right. apparently it's all to do with like the pheromones that we give off as right. women, and like okay. cats prefer men. It's okay. Okay, so um, do people, can people concur with this? Do cats prefer men? Let's have a show of hands. Who believes that? Okay, uh, Cookie? It's like, I feel like we can connect it in a way to the Oedipus complex. Yeah. Of like how some girls like growing up would prefer their dads over their mom because they right. want to be with the opposite gender. Could it be the same with cats? I'm not okay. sure. Okay, cats eat a pole. Uh, okay. Um. If, if that's right, you're saying cats are like women. Yeah. Genetically, like. Uh, okay, is that? I mean, we're, I feel like we're lacking a little bit of science here, even though we're in the Natural History Museum. Uh, my cat prefers my dad and my sister, my older sister. Right. Okay. That's so probably because. But that's because I probably torture the cat. Okay, maybe, maybe that's what it is. So maybe it's not actually a gender preference. Um, have, have we got any cat psychologists in the audience? I don't think we do. Uh, so we're just going to have to run with this, Evie. I don't know if this is the wrong thing to say in the Natural History Museum, but yeah. um, what is the point of doing a cat psychology like yeah. study? Okay, why would you study the psychology of cats? Um, anyone? No. What's that? Isn't the answer that science, you just study everything that you can okay, to get so data? Every subject is worthy of study in science. Do people believe that? Even cat psychology, <laughs> is it a worthy study? What's that? There's an ethical boundary, but I don't think cat psychology is, is what? on the threshold of that. Why? I just don't think, I don't think that's going to be particularly harmful to cats if you're just like... Yeah. Studying. I mean, I it could be. I don't know. Like, Okay, so there, I think there's a, what you're saying there is that study anything as long as it's ethical. Yeah, that's the question. Okay, okay, yep. Can we talk about how nature is gay? We've got gay dolphins, gay lions, gay everything. And yeah. why does everyone say being gay is not natural when nature is so gay? Okay, so, okay. Is Can we talk about is, that? Is nature gay? It is so gay. Okay, nature's not just gay, it's so gay. Okay. Okay. Any, has, that, has anyone here got a gay pet? 
Yeah. Uh, you, you too, yeah. Uh, I had a gay dog, and for some reason, yeah. he was a, a big a Labrador. Yeah. And he loved small dogs as well, like right. Chihuahuas. Yeah. Like okay. all the time. Yeah. Okay, so we talk, so we talk, we're saying that homosexuality, in whatever form, I mean, it rears itself. Um, we. It's, it's part of nature. It's part of nature. It's observed in nature. Yep. I don't, I don't know if it's just like this thing though, where we we as humans have a really complex society where we've like created lots of like categories of like what people mm. are, who people are. Whereas actually, is that a, like you know? So if it's like, oh, that's a, a gay penguin or something like that. Like, does yeah. that even make sense, or is that just an animal mm. finding someone to like? Um, well, okay. So this goes fulfill out, its urges. This goes out to everyone here. Does a gay penguin actually have a gay identity? Or is it just the penguin as far as the penguin's concerned? Yeah. yeah, come on, let's have some other people that haven't said anything yet. We're talking about gay penguins. Does it actually have a gay identity or is it kind of just the penguin? There has been research about some uh, animals yeah. being depressed when they're like far from the other partner, which yeah. could be the same sex. So there has actually been studies when they okay. dolphins are separated from another dolphin who yeah. is also like the same gender. And I think it's an identity, yeah. Okay, so it is an identity, at least in dolphins. <laughs> um, and we're talking about gender identity. It stretches further than humans. Where do we want to take the subject? Do we want to talk about the, how important it is to say... Is it important to say that um, different gender identities are natural? Is it, does that make a difference to being... Any, any gay people around, actually? We need your opinion here. Does it make a difference to say it's natural or not? If penguins do it... Does it make a difference? Yes. I, 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 yeah. I, I just can't see you consolidating it into like our classification of what an identity is. Like yeah. that's made out of so many nuances of right. narratives and yeah. kind of yeah. valence and feelings. Whereas I, I don't think a penguin could possibly have so you or any. Well, yeah. I mean, would yeah. have that level of well, awareness of themselves dolphin, to call though? it an identity of gender. What yeah. about a dolphin? We just. You never know. Yeah, okay. what it, yeah. What, yeah. What's it like to be a bat? We just don't know. Okay. You know what I mean? Right. It's like, how could you possibly try to perceive how it's seeing itself? Or Is that the animal that you'd like to know what it's like? N n <laughs> the animal in me? Yeah, I, would, did, I didn't say what's it like to be... What, uh, <laughs> I, I agreed. Yeah, okay. Absolutely agreed. All right, so, where are we going to go with this? We're talking about, can you, I mean... Can animals have complex identities? What's it like to be in, in, body, in the body of someone else or in the kind of mind of someone else or some, someone with a different identity? Uh, yep. Uh, I just heard from my friend talking about how we build our like houses and buildings based on the structure of insects and how nature is built. Like right. for example, a honeycomb is like built in a hexagon, perfectly like you yeah. know pretty and all that. With this, I wanted to say that with gender roles and other things that we construct in society, yeah. it is also kind of based on nature and animals. Right. So we can still talk about gender roles and all that stereotypical shit uh, by comparing it to animals. How like the mother is nurturing and like how that that is like that but is it does that limit us or it doesn't i just think yeah. like there are some subjects that we don't look at animals for because we're like they have less iq but yeah we doesn't everything lead back yeah. to that point doesn't everything yeah. le lead to nature in the end okay well that's a good question from cookie does everything lead sorry Ante, just leave that there because it's that's part of the look um i don't know if it comes from nature or not maybe it's a, like a flower like a sort of prototypical flower or does God exist? We could put this into a philological... Okay, unless you're I'll throwing in a does God exist into this. Uh, um, where do we want to go with this? Do, I mean, do people... Um, do, do, does everything come back to nature? What do you think? Is God part of nature? <laughs> it's God, what do you think? What's your view on it? Yeah, I want to put it out there. No, no, no. Yeah, but right. you must have a view to ask this question. Exactly. Is God part of nature? I don't know. So I'm, I have literally no idea. Okay, no idea, but it's a question you've got. Is God part of nature? What are people... I saw a flicker of a hand there. Was it over here? Uh, yeah. Well, have we gone too deep? Have we gone to the point where no one can actually ask a question? Yet? Are you no, saying... No. I was going to say the whole idea of science is based on, like, what we can see. Yeah. And, you know, if we can't see something, mm. you know, is that... 
Okay, so, you know, we're going beyond science. Haven't they done studies about faith and what it is that people actually see and psychology associated to that? And that's yeah. part of science as well. And that's not necessarily okay, something so you can perceive, but others can. So the study of God could be part of science, you think? Okay. Is there a limit? Because you yeah. sort of mentioned the thing with the ethics. Is there a limit to what science can study? We've, there's a, maybe an ethical limit, but is there also like a kind of spiritual limit to what science can study? Um, is there a... Yep, yep. I think on that spiritual level, you're talking about um, other consciousness. So then you could draw a line with ethics to say that it's harmful if it's harming something else that's conscious. But then you get to the question of what's conscious? Because then there's panpsychism, where yeah. that, that um, like idea just bases every single like thing on the planet has consciousness, yeah. even if it's not alive. So like a rock would be yeah. conscious. So I don't know if you want to think it's like uh, unethical to be like hurting oh, rocks. First hand up. Yeah. Okay. Wait, have, you got view, like? have you got a view? What's your, what's your view on this? Is a rock conscious? Is there a limit to what science can study? I believe there's a limit to what science can study, yeah. Like you mentioned, it's primarily based on what can be sensed, what can be quantified, and yeah, there's just some things like beyond the material world, yeah. your conscious and your experience, your subjective experience of the world cannot be cannot be measured, cannot be quantified, and I think that's where it falls short. Yeah. Short okay. of the tools, short of the physical realm. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so uh, we've got a new face to the table at the moment. We're sort of talking about, starting off with the gay penguins, have they got a nuanced gender identity? And now we're talking about uh, what the, are the limits of science? What can science, where does science, what can it not study? Or can it study everything? Can it study consciousness? Can it study things that can't be perceived? Can it study spiritual things? Can it study things that are not ethical? Uh, there's a point over here. So yesterday in my seminar at the University of Greenwich, we discussed how uh, researchers have studied some subject, subjects that shouldn't be studied. Mm -hmm. And one of the studies was about how a researcher did a study between the IQ levels between brown and African people compared to white people. Yeah. And I just said there is no point in that study. Whatever that proves, it just starts something nasty. Right. And the result of that is not needed because we're all yeah. humans. Why do we yeah. have to divide ourselves in groups and see the IQs of groups when we're all just humans. Okay. Uh, I think that is not something you should study um, because the results doesn't help with anything. It's just going to start a conflict. Okay. So you, that, was a, that is definitely a no-no for research. What do people think about that? Is that a legitimate field of study? Studying, uh, I guess, different skin colours and their IQ? Um, what, and how did that research come about? I would ask as well, I suppose. Yeah, there's a point here. This is going to be my last one. I like to leave, but it will matter. What if, what if your science goes and angers loads of emus? What if you're going to be attacked by loads of emus? Okay, there's let's the, bring that into the emu war category now. There's the emu <laughs> threats. There's emu, there are some emus in the in the in the um, gallery. So at the moment we're talking about we're talking about this thing. What can science not study? And cookies mentioned these studies, controversial studies about IQ and skin colour. Are you, are you sat down immediately? Have you got something to say right now or are you just picking up the pieces for awesome. now? Uh, the conversation seemed awesome so I just sat okay. to see if I can... So, hang on in there. So we're talking about what can science not study? And, uh, uh, and you're, I guess you're, you've got an ethical problem with that particular study. Uh, I just think that some studies are pointless. For example, like studying how um, men could be better than women. Like even gender studies sometimes like they just are pointless. Like okay. seeing who are stronger and like these things. I, yeah. I just don't see the benefit of it. Okay. So we're talking about where where should science not... Yeah, you had your mouth oh, open. I did. Judy, I did. I so you're going to say something. But yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'd actually go even a step further than that and say that uh, back to what uh, Erin said, I think. Uh, Evie, blame, yeah. Evie, blame the Victorians because the yeah. studies are actually founded on mainly white middle-aged men yeah. as scientists. So even going back to the IQ study, originally when that was created, it was about only for men as well. Right. And I think it's already skewed. So women didn't so, have IQs. Yeah, but it didn't. Yeah. So when you actually do these studies, they're already skewed because you're using data and analysis and questions that were already had unconscious and conscious bias included right. in them. 
Okay, so we're kind of like building on a legacy that's already biased uh, when it comes to these kind of studies. Does that mean you can't do the science? Can you do the science in a better way? Uh, where do we go with this? Estelle, give us a final thought. Uh. <laughs> what do you think of this conversation? Do, I mean, do you think that there are some things we shouldn't be studying? Are we, are we building our science on a biased sort of starting point? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, uh, sorry. No, not sure, not sure, okay. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, um, I want to resort to this this guy called Donald Hoffman. Have you heard of him? No, no. He's got his theory where he thinks that uh, everyone's consciousness is uh, yeah. It's like a visual image that you project, and right. it goes into the science, right? He, yeah. He says that y you take in like 50 million inputs of yeah. data but we only have the cognitive capacity to process around 50 right. out, out of that 2 million different data inputs. So he's saying what, what your reality is, what, how you perceive reality, that's a very small part of what you actually are experiencing. And it's because over time our senses have attuned to such a point where all they do is just focus in on one right. job. Right. And, um, that's a very Donald Hoffman, one of our Okay, others. so there's about <laughs> consciousness. Um, thanks for that. Uh, my sound effects machine seems to have broken. I think it got worn out by the kids. But, um, yeah, it's run out of batteries. But, um, I think, I feel like we're at a crossroads because I think, what's it, Dean, is it? Yeah, that's me, Dean's yeah, uh, So, um, Dean is, wants to talk about consciousness and about different ideas of where consciousness, what it is. But we've also got the thing about the studies. So it's kind of up to you, or maybe we can like uh, move those two things together and it, are the studies of consciousness themselves biased? Uh, or, uh, uh, yeah. I'm gonna leave, yeah. but my final thoughts mm. on, sorry, I don't know your name, are, if you think about all the kind of like mm. historic scientific experiments, they are all things which people probably thought at the time were inappropriate. And I don't think right. you can make growth in science if you don't investigate and explore things which are in comfort zones. So you've you, actually got to get out of the comfort zone. 100%. And there's always yeah. going to be someone, yeah. controversially, that gets offended at something. So I think yeah. you've got to do it. You've got to make these growths in science. 100%. Give us a final thought. Or an initial thought. Uh, to be honest with you, I think everyone here seems very knowledgeable. I, I don't have anything. I don't have anything to add. But I mean, it was nice to learn. It was science. nice to learn a lot what, from you what guys. What do you think about science? Does science go too far sometimes? That's a pretty simple question. It's a yes or no. Uh, or can I, no, I agree with what was said earlier on. Yeah. I think we should learn as much as we can and study yeah. everything. Okay, so it's all about learning. Sometimes it can yeah. be a bit dodgy or controversial at the time, but it will kind of somehow work out in the end. Uh, um, it's a difficult one because that girl, she did make yeah. a good point earlier yeah. on about yeah. um, like IQ and things like that which are controversial. Yeah. Um, but I think that generally if you do look deep enough in science you'll find out we're all the same. We're yeah. all capable of the same things. Yeah. Um, and what I initially wanted to ask actually was yeah. about evolution because yeah. I'm sure you guys could tell me better. Um, I wanted to ask if we all came from like the same part of the planet at the same time or if it happened in yeah. different parts of the world and like yeah. uh, then the migration happened and mm. anyway okay. all right so there's a where did we come from are we all the same we come from the same single point um did we come there's a few different subjects here i feel like the conversation's like fly fraying in three different ways maybe you could help tie this together and i think what you hinted towards is convergent evolution so it's when you can have um two instances of very similar uh, anyway, results I'll, that I'll evolution exactly reached. Yep. Sit down, give us a final thought, then leave, but you carry on your point. Uh, uh.
Yeah, go on. Sure. So, for example, the, the eye, for example, it evolved independently, I think around like 50 times um, in, the, in, the, in the entire animal kingdom. So, so that's an example of convergent evolution where you can have yeah. the eye evolve separately, independently of each other in different um, yeah. uh, environments. So uh, but for humans, I think, just because our gene pool is so limited and so sort of not diverse, I think we probably did emerge from a single geographical yeah. area that was isolated from the rest yeah. of the world, so as to bring about these uh, 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 well, for natural selection to act on. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, so uh, good to get a bit of science in there as well. So we're talking about convergent evolution, what about convergent conversations? Let me get a final thought from you. I'm trying to trying to put together what you yeah. said. What you said. So you said something about do we all come from one? Source. Yeah. Is that what was only the question? Was. Yeah. And what was he? What were you saying? In, he was in saying that, that you can have parallel evolution, like the eye evolved in so many different animals, and it looks the same, but actually evolved in a different. Uh, for, for, for example, the squid and the wait, human wait, eye. So, look so you're, the same. Sa you're saying the common ancestor didn't have any eyes, and then two split. They both didn't have eyes, and then they both developed eyes yeah. separately. Yeah. 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 So then that, that's like uh, environmental, then, right? Yeah. Do you because you can have so natural selection acting independently of each other. So, f yeah, okay. yeah, 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 but you can. Is this the final thought? Are you going to stay here? It sounds like you're staying in here and getting involved in this conversation. Um, okay, so we're talking about, I feel like we've moved on to natural selection. Uh, there's a little conversation going on over here. Bring it into the, throw it into the pot. I'm in the middle of the pot. Evie. Uh, well, we were talking a little bit earlier about like uh, yeah. we were talking about how we use the internet and like we're getting loads of information in all the time, so we're not very good at like remembering stuff. Yeah. And then so I think someone was like, "So are humans de-evolving?" But I was like, "No one. I don't think anyone. Anyone is dying before they've passed on their genes without being able to use the internet, for example. Okay, so, so I don't think an internet is something that's gonna. they being able to like. So I don't think humans are evolving or de-evolving. I think we just are. Okay, so we're not evolving. We've stopped evolving. Then. Yeah. Okay, are we, are we de-evolving? We've stopped evolving. Uh, I'm not really happy with Dean's final thought because there's more of a question. Uh, give us a final thought. Um, let's go to Ema, go on. Uh, I think uh, we're evolving thanks to the technology and internet, but not in the same way. And it's pretty interesting because us as, a, as human and uh, mammals, we evolve really slowly, but with the technology, we evolve evolving increasingly. So there is a big difference with the technology, and it made us evolve very yeah. um, fastly. And maybe we aren't prepared for that. Okay, so technologically, we're evolving super fast. Biologically, we're evolving super slow. Is that your final thought? It looks like to me. Um, we've got a, a new face over here. Tell us your name. Katie. Um, I was going to say that I thought that what you said about evolution was that we all come from like a common o genetic origin, which is the answer to the question, I think, right? Yeah. Mm. Um, and um, yeah, and I agree with that because that's what all the evidence points to. Um, but the other thing I was going to say about evolution, us evolving now, is that one of the most important parts of natural selection is reproduction. And literally every generation that we've got now is living a completely different life from the one before. And you need for uh, a uh, environmental pressure to be the same for generation to generation to generation to have uh, evolution. We have loads of variation, so it's noisy. but we're not having. Yeah. Um, we're not really having evolution, like yeah. in any particular direction at the yeah. moment, because from generation to generation, we're it not experiencing the much. same yeah. things. Okay, just going to get a final thought from Cookie because you've contributed a lot to this conversation. Um, so give us a final thought. Um, I think we as humans are smarter than animals because of how we think and I think sometimes our smartness stops it us, things. it limits us because we doubt ourselves so like this question about are we evolving or devolving, we're just too smart for our, for our own good, I think we're too philosophical that we're stuck somewhere, yeah. let's go further beyond that and uh, stop questioning ourselves, let's just develop. Okay, let's just and carry on yeah. evolving and stop I thinking think we're about too it. smart to the point yeah. where we're like doubting ourselves. Okay, stop doubting ourselves and just keep on evolving. So we're talking about evolution now. Um, your point again is that we, the, our, our environments change so quickly, like 
our parents had like pogo sticks and dealy boppers and you know football sticker albums and this generation's got iPhones and what will next generation have something different so we can't evolve because it just changes too quickly um, we just can't get around to evolving. But I'm not sure because if we think about technological evolution, it is though that if we think about in 21st century, it may see that uh, since the 20th century of the, mm. or, or the second half of the 19th century, the technological evolution has skyrocket. But uh, are we sure that the technological has, evolution has skyrocket only in the latest year or even since the 1400 or even yeah. during the Middle Age? It has kept the pace and simply we cannot notice because we were not living at that Okay. We, we only have documentation about the yeah. from uh, the, 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 the 19th century. This, okay, this so actually technology has always been rocketing, like the, the way that the horse and cart wheel slightly evolved. We didn't actually know about those kind of minor differences way back in history. We've always been evolving technologically. Go on. Yeah, I think it is definitely exponential because let's say you have one generation, call it Generation A, that does some technological progress, then you have Generation B. Generation B is not starting from scratch, so it's not going to be linear. Generation B is starting from the progress of Generation A, which was before it. So if you have each generation building on top of the previous generation's progress, then you do end up with the next generation doing more progress than the previous generation. Right. So if the second generation does twice as much progress as the first generation, and the third generation does twice as much progress as the second generation, that means the third generation did four times as much progress as okay. the first generation. So yeah. you will end up with exponential... We're, um, we're exponential progress, I think you're... Exactly, yeah, okay. in technology. Let's just have a straw poll. Who thinks we are evolving? Let's show your hands. Who thinks we are evolving? Who thinks we're devolving? We're actually kind of simplifying a few people. Who thinks we're doing neither? We're just staying in. Come and join in on this one. Yes, come on, I'm come on. Uh, uh, you don't have to be an expert here. Anyone be, you know, anyone's opinion is really important here. So uh, there's a point over here, yeah. I think mentally we're definitely evolving because the spread of knowledge is a lot quicker now. With the internet, with information, it can be spread massively, which we didn't have in the past. So we can work on each other's ideas and constantly grow. Um, so that's, yeah, that's mentally. Physically, yeah. well, as we're living more sedentary lives, because yeah. of technology, it's making our lives more comfortable. Um, you know, we're not moving as much around now, yeah. so people suffering from more back pain and yeah. uh, Are we issues with the hands. To be more used to that, to be more <coughs> of a, a streamlined couch potato. Uh, I don't think so, because our body is designed to move. Yeah. Like, if we're not moving and we're living completely sedentary lives, it yeah. leads to massive health ailments. So, okay. now, so that's we're not going to beat that instantly. Uh, as a point over here. Just to pick up on Katie's point, saying about we need pressure from our environment in order to evolve, but we're at the point now where we can shape our environment, okay. and so evolution doesn't necessarily take the form of us adapting to the environment anymore, but adapting the environment to our needs. And so in the point of... Yeah, so I don't know, what was your name, sorry? Bobby. Bobby's point on back pain, we no longer have to adapt our backs to have more res resolute backs, but we change our chairs to prevent back pain. We just change the chair design? Yeah, we, we control our environment now. Okay, that's a bit of an easy one. Final thought from you, Daria? No, I need to live for good, so I need to, to go out. I have an angry girlfriend waiting for me outside. But this means that this format is extremely useful. I think it should be spread because uh, this kind of debate, free debate, even saying silly things, I think is very important to evolve, actually. Okay, so this yeah. actually is helping us to evolve. Okay, so, oh, wow, well, that's, uh, that's a compliment for Tokyo Kisa. Yep. I personally think we're devolving because there's people asking questions and making statements like, there's gay penguins. Yeah, you think that's a devolving? Yeah, come on, gay penguins. Uh, yeah. Happy feet, pingu, the penguins in Madagascar, they weren't gay. Okay, so you're saying there are no gay penguins? Yeah, I don't think they identify as gay. Okay, so you don't think there are gay penguins? No. Is it, I mean, when you say that, are you, do you mean there's no... Um, I mean, do you mean that the penguins don't have a gay identity, or do you mean that they just simply yeah, I don't, think they do. don't get involved? I in think the they're just thing. like, you know, moving okay. around well, in Antarctic. 
it's a bit of a rewind back to an earlier topic. They just want to live a simple life, you know. They're not yeah. like us. You can do that on Tokyo Keys. I mean, where do we want to go with this? Do we want to talk about devolving? Do we want to talk about go back to the gay penguins? Um, we had quite a lot of interesting conversations earlier on about whether they've got a gay identity as gay penguins. But So what's your name? Hafiz. Hafiz? No, Hafiz. Hafiz was saying... That there are no such thing as gay penguins. Um, so let's, we can go back to that one. I feel we did brush over it before. Yeah, yeah. You know that, that guy with the glasses before? He yeah. asked the question, um, he said, is God part of nature? Yeah. I think that's a silly question because nature yeah. was created by God, wasn't it? Okay, so two questions. Wh which one would you like prefer to explore of those two? We can talk about God. Okay, both together maybe. Um, anyone want to respond? I thought there were some points over here. Yeah. I don't know much about gay penguins, um, but by definition, I, God is outside of nature. You can't be something within something that you create, so I completely agree. Yeah. Um, but if someone wants to talk about gay penguins, I'm all yeah. for it. Cause I mean, what, all right, we're, we're going to try to mix these two things together. Um, what, well, what is... The, the, what is what, how are God and gay, gay penguins, because the, the two things exist both as concepts, how do we work well, together when into a world? You, when you use the term God, what God are you talking about? Right? There are yeah. many different types of gods which are defined by different yeah. characteristics. So you're talking about Christian God, you're talking about Hindu God. They have different characteristics, yeah. so I think to use that word is, you know, narrow it down. Okay. Right? Uh, yeah, well, that's not my role in the middle here, but maybe someone around the outside could do it. Uh, my job is simply to pass the microphone around. Yeah. I'm going to go to new people first. I'm going to go to you, but I also want to bring in those people that are sitting around the table. I've got the. Yep. Uh, my name is Bob. And uh, say again. What? Bob. Bob. My name is Bob. Bob. Yeah, welcome, Bob. So, going back to evolution. Yeah. I kind of think that our culture yeah. broke the, the mechanism of evolution because. Yeah. Uh, the way evolution works with animals, right? The, the most. The, the, the animals that are most adapted to their conditions, yeah. they are able to, to have the most prodigy, yeah. uh, children, yeah. and, and so on and so forth. Exactly. These days, and not only these days, since we yeah. invented um, family planning, yeah. uh, the individuals that we would categorize as most effective uh, or most adapted to our current world won't be the individuals that right. have the largest so number of children. Broken evolution. So I think, and yeah. our cultural norms, yes, broke evolution. But right. that's why, mm. yeah. Okay. So that's the point. I don't know if you've got anything to add on either the God debate or the gay penguins. Um, we're still out there. I'm going to come to you in a second, Katie. But there was, uh, you had your hand. Oh, you, you haven't said anything yet. So come, you come first. Um, I think. I kind of disagree with that because I think evolution just has changed. Like um, the factors yeah. like capitalism is and wealth. Unbreakable in that sense. I think it is. Like yeah. we in this world, those survive who can afford to live and eat and pay for rent, and that's just that. I think that's causing evolution. Like right. if we look at a global statistic and beyond, like UK, which is. A yeah. quite a developed country there are lots of people dying of hunger in the world and that's right. in a way evolution because they can't afford yeah. food okay so it's a kind of tough evolution is actually a tough tough business isn't it um as i know people have had their hands up over here for ages you've had your hand up for ages so i'm gonna come to you so what you raised is actually a very good question i think like like or have we stopped evolving because we're not having children to the point where we can so it's mm. like there's another limiting factor than whether you yeah. can you can mate or can have children. Uh, I think um, so. There there is some evidence of evolution happening. So for example, lactose tolerance is a very is a very recently evolved characteristic in humans. I think so. I, I recently saw this map of um, um, uh, 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 of a particular gene that allows humans to be uh, resistant towards uh, HIV and it was more dominant in areas or that had epidemics of HIV so that was also a very recent example of so we are evolution. still evolving I yeah. think we are and yeah. devolving I really disagree with because yeah. it assumes that uh, we are going in another direction whereas evolution has no direction thing so 
evil, there is no end goal of evolution at all. It is change and it, it adapts to specific environments and specific times. Yeah. There is no end goal of evolution. We are not getting better. We are not improving. We are only changing. And okay. evolution doesn't have an end goal. Okay. Um, Kate? Go, go on. I was going to say something similar to what you guys said over there. Um, yeah, I think that um, evolution is kind of a used and abused word. Like evolution by natural selection, we're just talking about our biology. Um, when we're talking about technology, we're talking about something completely different. When we're talking about like our cultural progress, the way that we like connect and things like that, we're talking about something else as well that involves things like memes. Um, I feel like it's important when we're talking about evolution to be clear about which one we're but talking about. It, it, doesn't technology affect evolution? They are linked together, but I would still stand by the. The, the idea, I personally think this is like a lull, you know, this is a lull, yeah. it's fight, like diversify as much as you want and yeah. then when the pressure comes along, people who, some people will live, some people will die. That sounds really, really horrible, like, so we're having, <laughs> but, it, but we're it's having true. a holiday from evolution right now. But, but like you yeah. said, there are examples in some yeah. places of the world where people die and, and other people live where evolution is occurring in those places, but, but not everywhere. Okay, so round here, evolution's on holiday. Uh, was there was a point that you've had your hand up for a so while. So, I was just so. having a discussion that Mikhail brought up just now. Yeah. Um, like, evolution is constantly found in microorganisms, and yeah. you see that a lot, especially with viruses. Yeah. They're dealing with selective forces. We saw right. that with COVID. We see that with bacterial resistance. Um, at the moment, the NHS have a massive burden against antibiotic resistance because the bacteria are constantly adapting to right. what we're throwing at them. So evolution is occurring. I mean, with humans, it's, it's occurring at a much slower rate. But within microorganisms, which uh, reproduce at a much faster rate and replicate, you can see it accelerated. So you can actually okay. see evolution in so progress. So evolution can happen under your nose, so to speak, when it comes to microorganisms. Uh, there's a point over here, but do you, do you have a point? Yep. Just on the last few points, we've picked up on the biological elements of evolution and the kind of reproductive processes that feed evolution. But those are those are the processes that got us to the level we are at now. But perhaps evolution itself evolves to a new level where we're investing in cognitive processes and it's not about having as many children as you can in order to further your gene pool and get the adaptations yeah. out. It's about having fewer children and investing yeah. in the cognitive process of those children and so the, actually, the nature of evolution changes. So evolution has sort of gone into the brain, so to speak. Yeah, we're changing yeah. The, the way in which we evolve and it's no longer like biological organisms or viruses which yeah. have to reproduce as fast as they can to evolve. We have control over the process of evolution yeah. in our minds. So cognition is through, through discussions like this. Okay, all right. So, um, uh, so you've got a point over there. I'm gonna, you had a point. Uh, uh, I don't know who was first, but uh, um, basically, what I wanted to say is that um, yeah. I agree with the point. Oh, sorry, I forgot to get your. Sorry, I forgot to get his final thought. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Yep, that's fine. Uh, so yeah, my final thoughts are. Yeah, I totally agree with you with the fact that yeah we hacked evolution at this point. Like, um, what? Because the thing is, evolution in the animal kingdom is like you have a fitness function where you determine, okay, there's this criteria that you are judged on, and if you don't meet this criteria, you die, right? And if you die, you don't get to pass on your genes. For example, if you are an antelope but you are not fast enough, boom, you die. Uh, the fastest ones get to get to live, get to reproduce, and pass on their genes. So that the hope is that the children get to have foster genes, things like that, right? Whereas in our case, well, what's our fitness function? Like, what's, what's uh, killing us if we are not good enough? And I think the point you raised was capitalism and money, right? Uh, yeah, I think that's, it, to some extent, it's true. So and the I parameters have kind of changed, shifted radically. And the, by our yeah. own like as a byproduct of our own design like we've okay. designed a system where yeah money is the basis of all transactions so, here yeah and now if we don't have enough money we can't make enough transactions and boom we are doomed to die right? okay so in a way we've evolved out of genetic evolution into a capital monetary evolution okay um there's a those are points going off i, I didn't get your points so i'll come to you and then i'll come to you um yeah. basically what i 
wanted to say is that now I think the main difference that we have in terms of uh, how we are evolving is the fact that in nature you can have these random changes sometimes so that at some point things reach an optimal level and then they keep evolving uh, which makes nature also do mistakes sometimes that get mm. locked in organisms and yeah. never change um, like trees for example have an enzyme which is super inefficient but is in all trees that exist now and yeah. it got locked because of evolution and the way right. trees evolve right. but now because we introduce so much thought and planning into what we are doing these changes things is not so random anymore it's not yeah. so not well thought out. So there's a random sort of mistake making element in evolution that yeah. we're going to lose if, we, if it becomes more technological. Yeah, we're trying to change it, I think. Mm. Um, and so that's why we, I believe we are evolving in a very different way than how we were kind of in the past. Okay, so we have radical. This is kind of like the what we're talking about here. I just want to say this is Talkie Aki Freeform Talk Show. You can talk about anything you want. We've kind of hit on the subject of evolution and we stayed on it. Are we evolving? Are we devolving? Is it becoming a cognitive evolution rather than a um, a, a genetic evolution, is it a money evolution? Um, there's all these things. Uh, yeah. I think, hi guys. So um, I think that we are evolving in our choices because I think some one of you was talking about contraception and then technology, and I think that. Um, and the way we are evolving, yeah, we have more choices. We can decide, okay, um, what can we do? And also in the way of um, human yeah. rights. And looking on devolving, I think it's more about how do we use the choices which we have yeah. and do we really use them? Because I, I'm i like in the middle, I would say we are half devolving, uh, half devolving and evolving. So we have yeah. the possibilities, but we um, so yeah, it's in a we way have to we've got this choice ahead of us yeah. about whether to evolve or devolve. And what do people think about this evolution of choices? Is it about choices now that is uh, how we're going to evolve in the future? We've got spare seats here. This is a participatory uh, talk show where we wanted to come and sit down. Um, you don't have to say anything if you don't want to, um, but we encourage you to do so. And we've got a new face over here, so that's great. Um, yep. So. Just, uh, just to return to one point, mm. when I said the evolution, we broke evolution by introducing contraception and, and family planning, I didn't mean that it isn't progress. I'm just saying that evolution is this, at least in my opinion, we are now lost, we are using very different def definitions yeah. and it's not really clear what we're talking about because in my opinion, evolution was this pr process mm. of uh, that we had through na biological process through natural selection yeah and there's many other ways to progress and mm. evolution is not the only way to to measure progress okay so contraception family planning that's progress and we're progressing as a society as a result of of that okay but that's separate from evolution you're saying Yes, we, we shouldn't be calling yeah. every progress evolution. Okay. Was there a point over here, Avis? No, I just want to go back to someone's question. They asked, yeah. where is God, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that was... Uh, yeah. And no one could answer, which is yeah. strange. But um, I can give the answer. Yeah. Um, God is closer to you than your jugular vein. So whatever you may be going through in life, God is right next to you. You have to believe that. Okay. I mean, what, what, what about evolution? Is evolution part of God? Is God... Is that to be honest, I don't something? really believe in evolution. Charles Darwin or any of that. Yeah? That's, that's just facts. Okay, so you don't think that evolution is actually a thing? Okay. Uh, yep, I've got a point there. Can I ask you why? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. Okay, you want to know a bit more about it? Um, yeah. Genuine... But I'm I'm genuinely curious about um, really about why you choose to have why you choose to have faith in it. Um, I mean, faith alone can't be the the only reason you believe um, that evolution isn't um, that evolution didn't happen. So I'm just genuinely curious, not to put you on the spot, mate. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, there's a point over here. Come back to you on that. Yeah, I, I have like a similar question, but I think yeah. in general. I, I just don't want to make it sound like you're not believing in something that it's uh, common knowledge. I don't want to make it sound like that because it makes you in a spot. 
<laughs> no, yeah, yeah, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, like, ca can you have a belief that also goes uh, along with the facts that we know about? Like, I don't think evolution explains why we are here. So, can you have your faith filling that gap instead of like? So I, I, I feel put like. Put it from your perspective. You're saying that from your perspective, the evolution tells that story of why we are here. No, it doesn't. Like, it, 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 is, that what you, what, is that what you meant before? Like, okay, well, I didn't believe. I just said I didn't believe in Charles Darwin's theory and all of that stuff. Yeah. Really, that's all. Okay. All right. Uh, any other points on this? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think I think there's there's like two things. There's evolution, and then there's evolution through natural selection. So evolution just simply means that. There has been there have been changing changes in um, in life, right? So 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 what existed before is not maybe present today, and what pres is is there today is, was not present in the past. So if, for example, the dinosaurs existed millions of years ago, now they do not. That is evolution. Now what we can argue about is whether evolution or nat by natural selection um, is is sort of what brought about that evolution. Do you, do you believe in the Charles Darwin? Yes, I do, and I think like we we that we have more than a century of, of century of evidence. That has like almost beyond doubt, or beyond doubt, sort of proved proved in the in the, in the, in, the, in the scientific way that or that, that we can prove anything that that evolution by natural selection, right? So, um, like the eye, for example, or um, um, so, I mean, I, I, I can be more specific. So there's a so there's a there's a there's a, there's a, there's a there, there was a creature in the past around 200 million years ago something like a like a starfish right so and 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 it was very interesting so it had this um, the, it, was, it was basically like a starfish and the mouth used to be right at the center so it was sort of like fivefold symmetry which is quite rare in nature and then it was living for like tens of millions of years in the ocean uh, at the bottom of the, at, at this on the seabed and it was and it used to feed. Uh, microscopic uh, organisms uh, while while laying there it was quite stationary in its life, um, and then we see that suddenly, or well, suddenly in the in in evolutionary in evolutionary time scale. So that is not like one day. It's like in many years, many centuries, many thousands of years over many many generations. We see a relatively sudden change where um, uh, predators in the ocean increased by by a huge factor. So this creature now just could not uh, survive uh, in its current state where it used to uh, uh, be stationary, exactly, because it would just be eaten. So we see a very quick, a very relatively quick evolutionary change that now the mouth shifts from the center to the edge. And this is obviously not one creature, it's over many, many generations. But the mouth has shifted towards the end, so the five-fold symmetry is gone almost overnight in, sim in evolutionary time scales. And now, this creature digs a hole in the seabed, the mouth is what it's exposed, and that's how it feeds. Okay. So, I mean, how can you tell this? Oh, we can, we can tell this by looking at fossil records, right? So we have, and we can very accurately date fossil records, uh, and then we have, uh, we can triangulate that against, our, so we have lots of evidence that shows that this creature evolved. And all of that evidence shows us, or suggests that, that this evolution was by natural selection. The, the natural selection being the, in the, the change in the predatory landscape of the ocean. Okay. So that, is the that is the pressure that allowed natural selection to happen. Okay, so, okay, so it's about predators um, changing, so the starfish had to change, otherwise it was a... Did you want to say something? I, well, no, I was just going to say, I guess like sometimes there's like a tension or like when I've like, read about it on the news or stuff like that of like talking about creationism, evolution, you're thinking about religion, you're thinking about like does, can, like, can that sit with um, evolution? I, th I don't know, I, I feel like it can in the way that if you think a lot of religion is a lot of people writing down what they believe is a, like a faith, but they're maybe more likely to be wrong than like, because uh, I guess like religion for me was like anything bigger than yourself, so whether that's like God or whether that's like a logical system, whether that's just like the, like the amazing complexity of the world, and I think that fits and is part of evolution. So I don't know, I don't know if it's like the okay. same thing, but I don't think that they like, I don't think, that sometimes I think people assume that like it has to fight, but I don't know if it, it has to. Okay, is there a disconnect, is there a, 
dichotomy? What, what do people oh. think? Yeah. Um, I was, I was going to say um, about like natural selection and what is defined as natural selection. Do we define one species making another species the top of their respective sort of food pyramid or whatever? So like chickens being domesticated and being like the dominant thing, are they, is that natural selection or is that sort of basically divine intervention from another species basically? So is the chicken part of natural selection? And has anyone here naturally selected a chicken? Um, like maybe, maybe not yet. There's a prime example of that, the big massive cow that has loads of muscle, which was yeah. genetically bred to have lots of muscle. Yeah. So, so is that humans doing that kind of natural selection? Well, of course, I mean, that's the point of natural selection. It's whatever um, well, factors yeah. impact that being's existence. So, yeah, of course. Like, you've, yeah, you've got things like, net, like um, climate change, except all of these things play a part and put pressure to evolve and survive, and it takes a hell of a lot less time to wipe out the species than it does to make any um, significant evolution. Okay. So, extinction is quicker than evolution, in yeah, a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think this comes back to the point I was saying before, that like, I'm not sure about these changes, like domesticating animals or uh, doing very radical changes to nature, which happen, um, but I'm not sure if they fall into like uh, what we defined as evolution, or um, if well, they are. Say we, but what about you personally? Um, I think they are different because um, they are not random. They are very carefully yeah. <laughs> programmed by humans. It's gone now, but they, in your opinion, the chicken is not a product of natural selection. Your final thought of it is. I don't really have a final thought. I've got a final question. Can I ask Peter Parker when the next Spider-Man movie is? <laughs> okay, well that's that's one. I think we're we're gonna we're gonna just leave the. Um, um, I think because we were talking about kind of. Uh, I've lost the word now. I think there's a difference between natural selection and artificial selection. Um, so you've got selective breeding, that's the word I was thinking of. You've got selective breeding of things like cattle and chickens, and that's very much controlled by people. Whereas... <laughs> uh, so yeah, you've got all these processes controlled by people, that is very different from natural selection, which is a natural process, so very separated. I guess it depends on what axis you're looking at, uh, like evolution or... Exactly. Okay. Uh, we're coming into the last five minutes of this, so we're going to have to start to solicit some final thoughts, I think. Is that right? Am I getting that? I don't know how long we can go. I feel like there's a lot of mileage still left in this, but I sort of feel like we might need to be getting towards the final thoughts. Because, you know, I've got to go home with some sense of closure here. Even if nobody else does, if there's a lot more questions uh, than answers, as they always is on Tokyoki. Um, so we talked a lot about natural selection. We talked about um, the presence of God. We talked about spirituality. We talked about the limits of science, uh, where science can actually uh, can or cannot go, and where it should and should not go. Um, so there's a few things we talked about in this session. We've talked about gay penguins have come up a few times. Have they got a gay identity? Um, there's that whole thing. Uh, gender roles is how we actually started off this session. Uh, and nature. So just feel free to comment on any of those or something, something completely different. Uh, yep. Not more to settle the debate, but it's very much sort of in line with what's been talked about today about some things, whether they affect other things, um, and it's a it's a debate that that we have. Uh, is there a do you want to phrase the because I'll phrase it incorrectly and you'll well, you, is there such thing as causation or is it just not correlation? Okay, causation is there such a thing? So you can so my you need to explain that so my thing. We've, you've brought our personal debate onto a stage no, no, here. No, so unifies the whole thing. So causation, i.e., event X, yeah. leads definitively and 100 percent of the time to point Y. Okay, give right? Us examples. Don't say X and Y. Just say two events. If, 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 
if we'll be walking along and I trip him up and he fell, yeah. I would say I tripped him up and that caused him to fall over. Yeah. Whereas it, it, incorrectly, he would argue that that would be a correlation between me tripping him up and okay. falling over. And you can have more oh, extreme. I'm Will. He's George. Okay, so if George trips up Will, and I think he has sort of intellectual. Yeah. But yeah. If he trips up, if George trips up Will. Um, With extreme force, not just a, a brush. It would like it needs to have caused it. Yeah. Did, you, did George actually cause Will to fall? But it's the, the, it, the, it, it relates to the whole natural selection about yeah. whether certain events cause yeah. evolution or whether it's just like whether it's just correlated with the evolution of species. Yeah. Are these actually causations? Okay. I feel like that's a whole kind of like meaty meal of a in itself. It's not necessarily a final thought, but it's a good fi in a way it's a final thought. But it's a open it's food for thought for the for the next Tokyeki session. So it means Natural History Museum, you need to book us for the next session, uh, the next late. Uh, let's get some fun I feel like we need to get some final thoughts though. So let's get some final thoughts. Uh, well, we were talking about early in the first Tokyoki session um, that lot, we were talking about like social media being on the internet, and there was a lot of people being like, "Well, it's not good for you because it's not the real world." Like you know, like social media, they're not real people, not real friends. But why, just because it's virtual online, is it not real? Like if it's how we like interact with humans, and it's how we like make money, it's how we like you know, like we were talking to a social media manager, that was her job, yeah. like. Why are we suddenly calling it not real? Because it's like our whole, for a lot of people, it's their whole existence. Okay, so, oh, that's a very good point. I haven't, my, 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 my. <laughs> We get final thoughts now, so come, you don't have to have said anything yet. Come and sit down, come give a final thought. Yes, that's you. Um, any final thoughts, people? Have got final thoughts? Final thoughts is it? I did, it's a debate um, that we've had. Maybe, uh, there's a final thought here. I, I, I was making questions mostly, like, like, what, uh, like, uh, why were we talking about the correlation here? Like, when we, like, we're, I, I, I don't know. That, that's a sad thing. That, that's a sad thing. That's a sad thing. I'm sorry. It'll be more real. Um, uh, final thoughts come, people. I, I feel like we haven't really got. Yeah. Um, like, I, I, I just find it, I think. In all this debate, I found very interesting, like uh, where we put the line between what is real and what is natural, because at some level, I feel like all the society we have is not uh, uh, natural, or like we would say it's real, but like we started getting together uh, from hunter and gatherers groups, and from that moment on, like we started worshiping gods or having like other meanings in life. Uh, and I'd say, so maybe all our interactions are sort of artificial and not natural at some level. So it, it all depends where you put the line on what you consider natural or real. Okay. But, I mean, what about gay penguins? Well, that, that's the same. Right? They're as horrible. <laughs> but again. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna try to touch on like the few, the two last points. Um, for me, the internet and like being online was something I was feeling guilty like for a long time, and then I realized that the connections you can make there are real, and it's real people, and the fact that they are not there shouldn't feel, shouldn't make you feel guilty for spending a bit of time to like talk to them. So there's a kind of moralism, I think, you need to this. Yes, uh, about causation. In my opinion, it exists. Um, but I, I understand that there is also the other, <laughs> the other side. Because I think that some events can lead to other events. Um, and there are examples for me which are definitive. Maybe if you, maybe if you move it to like complexer things, like is there a cause for a war, is different, but uh, yeah. Uh, okay, final thoughts, final thoughts. Oh, I, I, um, I'm not sure of your name, but I just, um, what I really want to say is that um, you, I really just wanted to expand on the interesting question that you had, um, just by saying, uh, yeah, is there actually cause for a war, or is it pretty much just um, ingrained in human nature? And it really, um, it, uh, it reminds me of a, uh, a conversation I was having um, 
uh, about a, a world where we had resolved climate change and resolved wars. And the question was, would humans, um, just with their um, ingrained, uh, uh, with their ingrained desire for a conflict with each other, as it were, that kind of tribalistic thing, um, would we go on to make the same mistakes purely because it's in our nature, or are we capable of changing our nature for the greater good? Ties into that evolution. Hope I made sense. Absolutely, and maybe that was, you know, that could have, yeah, uh, could have fed into that and can still feed into this question of evolution. Would we evolve ourselves to actually stop killing the climate and stop war and stop doing all those bad things that human beings do. Final, that's a really good final thought. So final thoughts, final thoughts on this side. Final thought, do you have a final thought, Timna? Um, I now have more thoughts thanks to your final yeah. thought. Um, I will just say let's keep on evolving without harming any other people. Okay, yeah. so harmless evolution could be the next big thing. Uh, final thoughts on this side, final thoughts, final thoughts. I, I would love to be optimistic and hope that we can w strive towards a world without like a cri climate crisis, without war. Um, I think in some ways it does feel like there is tribalism, like there's an inherent in-group and out-group, but it seems like with social media, uh, it can be really divisive and it can really split people mm. apart, but it can also bring people together. Like it can connect people across the world. It can bring together people with very uh, diverse, but similar interests in a lot of ways and I don't know I'm, I'm hopeful I hopefully we can continue yeah. to connect rather than divide okay so maybe I'm gonna put that down so I'm gonna sum that up as maybe yeah, yeah. Um, I was just thinking about the the internet and stuff like that but because at the beginning there were some conversations about like um, the way that like social media is and things like that but I kind of feel like the internet and the way we interact with each other is a form of learning as well. We talk about AI, but I feel like it's a, ter it's a way of collectively learning and also developing a collective morality. Like, we start off with people who are just trolls <laughs> and yeah. just like saying so that's horrible things. the thing. first step on a kind of think, ethical I, ladder. I feel like yeah. I remember at a time when I was a teenager where mm. I was a troll. And, <laughs> and, you, and, and, it, and it, it's like a stage and you get feedback and you get kickback. It's not the same as the feedback we get in real life from each other as we're like learning to be social beings in real life. But I feel like the internet is developing its own morality because it, it's kind of, it's AI is us. Yeah. Okay. Very deep final thought. Final thought. Um, I think um, you raised a really good point, both of you, about um, is it inherent, the in group, out group? Um, and I think it's, it's, I don't think it's inherent, but I think humans tend to be very defensive. Like um, so I, I saw here in the discussion today, like people had very strong beliefs. And I think it becomes in the war or the dis divisions become inherent when we're not willing to be tolerant and open minded. Um, and I think that's been causing for centuries. You've had your final thought, sorry. Uh, final, 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 final thought, but make it quick. Thank you, thanks. Yeah. Um, does this potentially sound like a, a plausible way of, um, of not necessarily completely resisting our nature, but rather learning to live in harmony with it? Um, do you think it's possible, for example, our innate uh, predisposition to having conflict with each other, is it possible to, for all of us to collectively be aware of it and redirect it into a more harmless pursuits? I hope I made sense okay, again. Okay. All right, that's a great final thought. Any final, final, final thoughts? Final thoughts? Okay, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we've discussed about like change in evolution. I think uh, one of you were mentioning about different types of evolution and us mixing up, mixing them up. So I think I'll sort of the way I think about it is we've got we've got biological evolution. So one type of evolution which is extremely long term. Uh, we don't see it across generations. It's only across multiple thousands of generations. So we've got this huge envelope. Uh, of biological evolution, and we can't control. We can't control it. We have to work with our biologies, and it doesn't have a purpose or a direction. It's just change. Within that huge envelope, we've got artificial selection. So that's sort of the, we talked about livestock and cattle and so on. But within that, we've got cultural and technological evolution. Now, this is interesting because the time scale of cultural and technological evolution is extremely small compared to biological. This is the only type of evolution we should actually can actually do something about. We that it can have a purpose. 
it can have a direction and we can choose that direction. So I think, but the problem is it's constrained by our biologies and we can't do anything about our biologies in the short term. So let's sort of work within those constraints and choose the best, best parts for cultural, social and uh, technological evolutions. Um, so yeah. Okay. Over here. Okay. Uh, my final thought is uh, a lot of the conflicts, but also a lot of the joy in our world, is all based around us wanting just to belong. So you want to belong, you want to feel like you are justified in existing, you want to be happy, and the problem is when that comes into a conflict with anybody else, and when it can lead to tribalism, that's where you get the problem, I feel. But we all need to belong, we all need to feel happy, yeah. we all need to do things that make us happy in our lives, and mm. um, we've just got to be careful that they don't lead to these things. Okay. Yeah. Great final thought. I'm going to leave it there unless there's any fi there's a final, 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 final thought you haven't had. So, yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> that's interesting, but I think that the overarching human trait is the need to survive, not to belong. Okay. We're going to leave that. Okay, for our final, final, final thought. So, we talked about agreeing on the previous points of evolution. I think it all arises on how entropy itself works, right? So we, we are basically conscious creatures, we try to fight entropy, we try to create structure. But let's just try to embrace it, right? Maybe artificial intelligence that takes us over in the future, maybe it understands that the power is in love instead of actually trying to supersede the previous existence. So we might just be optimistic about the future. Okay. I think climate change, it is preventable and we will find a way around. Okay, that's a great final thought. I'm going to leave it there because otherwise it's going to be final thoughts. Oh, okay. All right, okay. All right, final, make it very, very quick. Final, 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 final. We might be overthinking our existence. I think it could come down to that we're just a part of a biological cycle where we are born, we reproduce, and then we die. Okay. We're born, live, die, get over it. But that's what I'm going to go on and carry on living and eventually die. And thanks everyone for taking part in Tokyoki. <laughs> thanks to Rick on camera and thanks to Evie for hosting the first half. And thanks to the Natural History Museum for being such great hosts and helping us get the conversation going. Thank you to everyone that's taken part. <laughs>